Hey guys, welcome to The Boost. We are fully in the holiday season. We're hoping to make your spirits bright today. So let's start with our very own Jenna Bush Hager channeling her inner Santa. She teamed up with Pay Away the Layaway to help deliver special holiday surprises to some remarkable families. There's holiday magic in the air at Burlington and Brooklyn, New York. And these unsuspecting shoppers have no idea what's in store for them. Guys, I am here in the layaway room where there are thousands of items for over 200 customers. We're gonna surprise them big today and tell them that we are paying off all of their layaway. It's all thanks to Pay Away the Layaway, a nonprofit that collects donations all year long to pay off balances nationwide. Since 2011, they've helped out 15,000 families. We've heard so much about so many families struggling this year yeah. and really stretching to make the holiday what they want it to be. Yeah. Executive Director Julie Sullivan paid the bill for every layaway with children's items. Our mission is to inspire hope and spread kindness. A lot of these people don't know if they're going to be able to buy some of these gifts. How do you feel like it spreads joy? When we tell someone that their layaway balance is paid off, we see reactions that span from jumping up and down, clapping, cheering, to breaking down in tears and sobbing. And what we've really come to realize is it's really a stress reliever. Three, two, one. Happy Holidays! I was honored to join the team of Holiday Helpers as we began wrapping toy after toy. Here you go. You're welcome. We quickly got into the holiday spirit. Jingle bells, jingle all the way. It wasn't long before our shopping carts were filled with as many toys as Santa's sleigh. It was time to set up the operation for our big surprise. We placed hidden cameras on towers of toys, disguised our volunteers as store employees. And the most important part, calling in the shoppers. You can sign in. Thank you for coming today. They were invited to the store for what they thought was a promotional event. The crowd made their way back to the layaway counter. It was go time. Are you ready to go out? OK, okay. let's do it. Let's go. Hi, everybody. Hi. How are you? I have an announcement. Are you all ready? Yes! OK, well, thanks to pay away the layaway, we have a huge surprise. All of your layaways have been paid off. <laughs> the holiday spirit instantly swept through the store. Can this take some pressure off and give toys to some kids? My grandkids. Your grandkids. Thank you so much. Customers were bursting with joy and also relief. Are you happy? I'm so happy. Does this help? I'm still happy. Let me laugh. Who are the presents for? Oh, my daughter, and I have the last of you. Well, we're glad we could get you presents for your daughter. Baby Tahara also had special items on layaway. What is she getting from here? Oh, I bought her a nightlight and some clothes. A nightlight and some clothes, clothes to keep her nice and warm. Yeah. Yes. So does this help y'all? 100, anything, anything else. The store's youngest customer was baby Caden, who is celebrating his very first Christmas. And are there some presents in there for him? Um, some shoes and some stuff. Shoes. He's grateful for it. He's grateful. Merry Christmas to you, baby. Nielle's shopping list included toys for her eight grandchildren. It feels so great because there's a lot of strain over Christmas and getting everything together, but you have so much loved ones to buy for. Yeah. It's just for overwhelming relief. Overwhelming relief. Do you feel the Christmas spirit? I feel the Christmas spirit now. <laughs> yes, I do. I don't know. Woo! Like dancing. Yeah. <laughs> Making spirits bright in an unexpected place and a beautiful celebration of the season of giving. Happy holidays! With Christmas almost here, we know Santa's elves are working very hard. Craig Melvin got to meet one of the honorary helpers who's devoted to giving back to her community. Good morning, good morning. At this intersection, Angela Thompson is the bright light. Paris, how was your day? Did you have a better day from this morning? For nearly two decades, she's been helping elementary school students cross the street safely. You get to see these kids grow up. You say hello in the morning, 
You say goodbye in the afternoon. But it's not just a hello and goodbye for me. In the mornings, I can have a child having a bad day, and I'm always, you know, how can we make your day better? And during this time of year... Let me clock out first. Angela spends her time off the clock spreading holiday cheer. And this one as well is 25% off. By organizing her very own toy drive, shopping for gifts to give to the children who brighten her day. She is the good constant guard. She'll come out of nowhere just to make sure we get across the street. Let's go back to the beginning of this toy drive. How was this born? There was a young mother, and she was just crying and talking about what she couldn't do for her children. And so I told her, I said, hey, see me next week. So that week when she stopped and saw me, I had all of these gifts and her tears, oh my God, her tears just, it, it, it's just, it touched me. It just made me wonder how many young parents are going through something. Thanks to donations from her family and friends, like her daughter, Asia. Angela makes her list. 337.56. Then checks it twice. This year, Angela and her hardworking elves are wrapping over 70 gifts. Each toy wrapped a gift in more ways than one. I'm helping out because the love for Angie and her passion for what she does. Angela and Santa Claus have a plan. They will deliver the wrap presents to students right here on the last day before winter break begins. I suited up with Angela, stop sign in hand. Oh, we got one. To meet the kids on her shopping list. Okay. All right, let's go. Here, here we go. go, Craig. We're here moving. We go. We're moving, What's up, Craig. Little man? You on a nice list or the money list? Hi. <laughs> okay. You look like you're probably on. on the nice list. Merry All Christmas. All right, Craig. You gotta be oh, some light back. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you are hilarious. Sorry. Craig, you're gonna get fired on your first day. What are you gonna get past me? No, no. I'm not losing a kid on my watch. How was your school day? Yes! Yes! Angela, what happens if you run out of gifts? The time that I did run out of gifts, a good Samaritan stopped and brought me gifts. But this time, we didn't want to take any chances. We took Angela to Fisk Elementary School. This is where those kids we met attend class. Angela had no idea what was waiting for her. Oh, wow. What is wow. this? Wow. Hello. Hi. Y'all know Miss Angela? In honor of your hard work, the folks at Hasbro have decided that they are going to give a gift to every child in this auditorium on your behalf. Santa elves, y'all come on out. Now, let's travel to a small, picturesque town where a very special ice skating rink has transformed daily life in a remarkable way. He's, here's Harry Smith with that story. In these days when it feels like there's more going on that pulls us apart than that which draws us together, we present this contradiction, the brand new ice rink in Springfield, New York. I mean, it's just crazy. It's like this every day here. Galen Crickey is the town supervisor. The day we visited, wind chill was six below zero. And this kind of weather, people out here shoveling away and people donating skates. We have 50 pairs of skates and they're all donated. Kids, adults, beginners, all are welcome. And by the looks of it, all are darn happy to be here. How big of a plus has this been for your town? Oh gosh, huge, huge, very big. There's not a lot to do here in the winter. Maggie Picorni teaches middle school and comes here often to unwind. People come and want to get out, you know, after work, after school, get some fresh air. It's a great place to be. It sure looked great to us. And how we wondered did this come to be? A $5,000 budget and a vision. 
And I thought about it for two weeks and it kept nagging at me and nagging at me. And I was nervous because I knew it was gonna be a lot of work. But when you have an idea that strong, you can't ignore it. The frozen equivalent of Field of Dreams, says Ashley Sykema, who runs the parks here. When we built it, we started saying, if you build it, they will come. And they came. <laughs> and they keep coming more and more every day. Built in large part by town folk, ultra-capable Amish neighbors who already had ranks of their own. Out of respect for the Amish, we blurred some images. None of them would take any payment. The town offered to pay them and they wouldn't take any payment. And Amish man, Wayne Stutzman, who led the effort, even came up with a backyard version of a Zamboni to keep the ice smooth. Normally, we're out here for at least two, at least. Uh, we're coming up, I think we're coming up on four hours now, so. Uh. Benjamin Munyon and his daughter, Bridget, are here most every day. How much do you like coming out to the skating rink? I like it a lot. You like it a lot? I can tell because I see no sign in you four hours in of like, it's time to go, Dad. I don't see anybody. You're not tugging on your dad's sleeve. No. I think we would spend all day out here if we could. It's not fancy, this ice rink, but it seems to function in a way that far exceeds anyone's expectations. When we all get together and we spend time together and we get to know each other and focus on what we have in common, that joy just builds and spreads. Imagine one of these in your town. You know what they say, if you build it. After the break, we're kicking off the holiday season into high gear with sisters who show us just what it takes to be a Radio City Rockette. Stay with us. Welcome back to The Boost. It's Christmas time, and Dylan Dreyer is spreading happiness and cheer by bringing us along with her family to a Christmas tree farm. Take a look. Can you guys believe it's time to get our Christmas tree already? Yeah. Are you so excited? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Brian, the boys, and I took a trip to Elwood Pumpkin and Christmas Tree Farm in search of the perfect pine to enjoy throughout the holiday. We've got Lee here. Hey, Lee. What do you recommend? Where do we start? A lot of people make a mistake at a big tree farm like this. They, they choose the nicest tree, but they don't think about longevity. I mean, these, these not only are they tall, but they're perfectly shaped and they're absolutely beautiful. That doesn't happen by accident. Dave, I love Every one is perfect. I want a big one. Brian, we have a ceiling. I'm gonna go full Griswold. Cal, tell mommy to get the biggest one, okay? Cal, don't listen to him, buddy. This happens to be right. a Norway spruce. It's what they use in Rockefeller Center. I'm sure you see, have seen that tree, right? <laughs> According to Lee, spruce trees are more likely to lose their needles as time passes, especially without proper care. I've had people that want them and say they have success with it. It didn't take long before we fell in love with a tree. Oh. Remember this tree. But we wanted to look around before deciding. I like the height, but it might be a little skinny. All right. You don't think it's a little too short? Well, I guess it's not too short for you. Well, you know the hard part now? We have to cut it down. 
It was Brian's time to shine as he took on the task of chopping down our tree. Can we get a stunt double? <laughs> Look at Daddy cutting down a tree. The whole tree's wobbling. Oh, here it goes. Oh, there it goes. Come on, guys, help me. Help me, help me. Ah, it's like a tree. Pull the tree. Yeah. Is this the first time you ever cut a tree? Yes. Sure. Tree's hands, no calluses. <laughs> but the job wasn't done. Here we go. We had to get the tree all the way back to the car. After a while of sitting in our backyard, it was finally time to bring in the tree. Look at this. And upon inspection, we found a little surprise within its branches. There's a bird's nest in here. <laughs> Are you guys ready for some ornaments? Yeah. One of my favorite family traditions is talking about each of the ornaments as we put them on the tree. Daddy made this when he was little. It's a gingerbread man. Yeah. But on the other side, he burnt the cookie. What? Hey, Calvin, this is a replacement for the one when you threw a football at the tree. Come on, Chef. Whatever you want. I'll hang it on the tree. Right in the front, buddy. Yeah? Yeah, put it on the tree. And before we knew it, it was Christmas in the Fischera household. We're done with our tree. There we go. There we go. Nice. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Now let's meet two sisters doing those signature holiday high kicks side by side for the very first time as Radio City Rockettes. NBC's Joe Fryer has their story. For so many of the Radio City Rockettes, before they were dancing on the stage, they were watching from the audience, including Jordan and Danielle Betcher. You probably get this a lot, but are you sisters? <laughs> we, we are sisters, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Danielle, the oldest, remembers seeing the Christmas Spectacular with her grandpa when she was 13. And he must have seen that look on my face of just like pure joy because he leaned in and he goes, you know, someday you could do that if you wanted to. Ten years ago, she did, and seven years ago, her sister did. This year, for the first time, they're right next to each other on the kick line. I just know that she has my back, both on and off stage. Danelle Morgan also has their backs. Old Saint Nick will ride the sky. She's a swing, ready to step in when someone is out. It's an incredibly challenging job. We don't just learn the one track that a single rocket will do in the show. We learn the entire show. Sometimes do you only have like a moment's notice before you have to jump in? There have been times where it's mid-show and then all of a sudden we're on the stage. An 18-year rocket vet, she knows her parents could be in that audience. They pop up and they show up in the front row for a show where I'll, I'll hear my dad cheering and I'm like, oh my gosh, my parents are here. They didn't tell me they're here, but they're here, okay. So your parents don't always warn you that they're coming? Oh no, they don't always warn me. I can see my mom's glasses reflecting with the lights and it's just really special to know that there's love coming at me while I'm performing. Reminder, the Rockettes are not just in sync with each other, but with you too. Joe Fryer, NBC News, New York. Still ahead, we'll pay a visit to some of the most festive spots in the world. We're back after this.
We are back on The Boost with holiday movies on practically every single channel and seasonal songs playing everywhere you go. It seems that everybody's full of holiday spirit. Joe Fryer is back with more on how Christmas cheer is spreading all across the country. In Manhattan, you'll find a bar that's already decked the halls and ceiling. Why did you decide to come here? Because I love Christmas. Miracle on 9th is a holiday pop-up bar. The other 10 months of the year, it's known for tequila and mezcal, but today drinks are served in Christmas-themed mugs. As Mariah Carey plays once an hour. It takes us four days to, you know, redecorate the entire bar, replace everything with the, the kitschiest Christmas things we can find. This year, Miracle and its counterpart, Sip and Santa, have opened nearly 200 pop-up bars nationwide. These like reservations came out in early October and I was already looking at them. Christmas trees are going up faster and Christmas tunes are hitting the charts earlier. Spending on non-gift items like clothing and decorations forecast to jump 25% this year. Being in Christmas time, like this is, this is when we bond the most. It's as if we're yearning to live inside our favorite holiday flicks. Christmas is the greatest day in the whole wide world. Whether it's Elf, which is celebrating its 20th anniversary. Hard to believe that just two days ago, none of us even knew one another. Or newer fare offered on networks like Hallmark, Lifetime, Netflix, and more. Entertainment Weekly counted 116 new films this year. Hilton even has Hallmark Channel inspired hotel suites. Cheers. For those who want to take the spirit and spirettes home, holiday cocktail classes are in full gear. Get up and smell. At the cocktailery in Charlotte, customers want wintry recipes like apple spiced cozy cognac, capturing that just cold enough for a scarf or reuniting with your childhood crush in your hometown feeling. We are slammed with people coming in and looking for those um, holiday flavors, cranberry, pecan, all those, you know, warm and cozy flavors. And the holiday cheer isn't just limited to land. Sometimes, as you can see here, it spreads to the water. We set sail on the Coco and Carol's cruise put on by Classic Harbor Line. Those who hopped aboard say after a stressful news year, they need a little Christmas now. Everyone's in a good mood, everybody's happy. You're about to have time off of work. So whether you're seeking a ship or a sick, for many there's no such thing as too early or too much. At Christmas time, the stately homes of Britain come to life with opulent decorations. And that is certainly true at High Clare Castle, better known as the real life Downton Abbey. It's where the popular show and movies were filmed. NBC's Kelly Cobiella got a special tour behind the scenes at the British Castle. Christmas time, Britain's stately homes come to life with opulent decorations. And that's certainly true at High Clear Castle, better known as the real downtown or Downton Abbey, where the popular show and movies were actually filmed. NBC's Kelly Cobiella is there enjoying the festivities. Ooh, show us around, Kelly. Guys, good morning. Well, it takes nearly a year of planning to get this castle Christmas ready. And we were given an early invite to see all the trimmings with the Lord and Lady themselves. Highclere Castle, a festive treat at Christmas. What a tree. It's beautiful. Now this screams Christmas. And it's how tall? It's 25 foot, which means I think it's bigger even than Windsor Castle's Christmas tree. <laughs> it's all about the bragging rights. Lady Carnarvon told me putting up the 25 foot Christmas tree this year was an Instagram hit, a team effort needing at least 20 people. And with true love and brother. In Christmas's past, the Highclere tree featured in memorable scenes from Downton Abbey. This year, there's a historical family theme. So the King theme Tut. is about ancient Egypt and Tutankhamun and the gold and the treasures. I visited Egypt last month, a hundred years after the discovery, and saw the treasures of Tutankhamun in the Cairo Museum. It was Lord Carnarvon's great-grandfather, the fifth Earl of Carnarvon, who discovered the tomb in Egypt along with Howard Carter. But when he first started out there, all he found in his first season of moving thousands of tons of earth was a mummified cat. 
many of us would have quit at that stage. And far from that, he was so determined, it actually spurred him on. The castle boasts 300 rooms, many like the library, lavishly decorated for the Christmas holiday. How many trees are in the castle? There are 60 inside and outside. Six zero. Six zero. That's a big Christmas. The next one to your left is going. And in the dining room, the immaculate table is laid out with precision, ready for a feast. And with celebrations in mind, it's time for a holiday cocktail. Louis Coelho is Heichler Castle's head butler. He makes their signature gin and tonic. Let me do a little bit of rosemary. Rosemary actually does have a sort of a Christmassy flavor as It does, as well. actually. It's quite warm, I think, and orange. Well, should I try? You can smell the orange and the rosemary. Keeping in the spirit, Downton style. Ready to ring in the new year. The castle is open to the public for most of December for afternoon teas and Christmas cocktails. And after a couple of weeks of private family time, they'll start planning all over again for next year. Stick around for another joyful story that's coming up after the break. on the boost right here with one final feel-good story. Check it out. Uh, this one's all about getting a little boost from your friend. So a school bus driver recorded this video saying this happens daily when a young student exits his bus. Ready, David? Look at me. Give me a thumbs up. All right. That's right. Go, David. What a cheering wow. squad wow. from the back well, of the bus. Fast. The bus driver, by the way, claims to be the fastest kid alive. He always runs. Uh, look at him go. Look Why wouldn't you run home? You have a cheering squad waiting. Come on. He's like He's running David Gump. Running home? Man. Yeah, fastest kid alive. Aw. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed today as much as we did as we count down to Christmas. We will see you right back here tomorrow on Today All Day. Welcome to today. Every day. We are adding to the star power in our studio. The biggest names, only on today. See, we're coming to this early, right? But it's today. Like I won the lottery. How do you feel at this age, this stage? Liberated. We're just getting started, folks. Ain't no stop with us now. The boys are back in town. The boys are back in town. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. This has been fantastic. Everything and everyone you're talking about, only on today. 
Hey guys, welcome to the Boost on a big day here at Rockefeller Center. Tonight is the annual lighting of our Christmas tree. But before its shining moment, check out the story behind the Norway spruce's journey from upstate New York to right here on our plaza. Here's Joe Fryer. When Matt and Jackie McGinley moved into their Vestal New York home in 2019, they paid little attention to the giant tree towering over their driveway. We had a whole punch list of things that needed to get repaired, things that we wanted to update or remodel. And frankly, the tree was just kind of in the background. But someone else did take notice, Rockefeller Center's head gardener, Eric Pause. In pulls a car, a uh, guy gets out. My name is Eric, I'm the head gardener from Rockefeller Center. I'm here to look at your tree. <laughs> and I was like, no. <laughs> Do you like understand how crazy you sound right now. They couldn't have known Pase is a Rockefeller Christmas tree legend, having personally discovered each tree for the last 30 years. I Googled him and realized, and I quickly texted Matt, this is legitimate. We thought they were dating a lot of other trees, that maybe ours would be considered. And then as the date got closer and closer, we realized that in fact, we probably did have the Rockefeller Center tree. The Beginleys knew they wanted to be part of this special tradition, and donating the tree they hope it brings joy during a busy and sometimes emotional season. This is not about us, but it's about being of service to other people, giving them that chance to go and make memories by the tree. And for those like us who've had loss, to go back to that space and remember the people that they love, McGinley's will be remembering Matt's mother, who passed away four years ago. I think she would think it was the coolest thing. Like I keep having this feeling of like, who am I not telling about this? There's somebody that, that I should be, that I feel like I ought to tell, and it's her, you know. Um, I was able to reach out to her best friend, and that person will be with us on the day of the cutting. The McGinley's two kids will be at the tree cutting too. Zoe, age 12, and Charlie, age 9, admit the hardest part of the whole process was keeping their tree's star status hidden until the official reveal. <laughs> I'm really bad at secrets, but I've been able to keep this one. <laughs> the tree stands 80 feet tall. It will arrive in this very spot this weekend with a full police escort, and it will become a part of New York history with 50,000 LED lights making it shine bright as a symbol of the holiday season. Three, two, one! Yeah! The deeply rooted tradition of the Rockefeller tree goes all the way back to 1931, when a Christmas tree was put up by the construction workers building Rock Center. Today, more than 100 million people visit the plaza each year to see the world famous tree. McGinley say they're proud that tree from their own yard is playing a special role. Matt's mom used to always emphasize joy, and so that idea of joy in that space is really exciting. Such a beauty, and we'll see you later tonight during the star-studded lighting on NBC and Peacock. Now, though, let's turn to another holiday adventure around New York City with our girl Donna Ferris, and she had all the hot spots to get into the spirit of the season. Christmas in New York is magical, from the world-famous Rockefeller Center tree to the dazzling windows and light show at Saks Fifth Avenue. There is no place like it. If you can finish this sentence, Christmas in New York City is... Magical. That's my word, too! At Macy's Santa Land in Herald Square, you can have your very own Miracle on 34th Street. Santa! I'm so excited to meet you. I saw you at the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, and I thought, I have to come visit you. Do you have a special Christmas wish, Donna? Well, I would love to see the Sugar Plum Fairies at the Nutcracker on stage. Oh, the wonderful, wonderful Nutcracker Ballet. Well, it looks like my wish to Santa came true. Throughout the month of December, ballerina Ashley Hod takes the stage in George Balanchine's The Nutcracker. You even smell like a Sugar Plum Fairy. <laughs> Seeing the Nutcracker at Lincoln Center during the holiday season is so iconic. 
Why do you think that is? You have a Christmas tree that grows up to 41 feet tall, snowflakes twirling around. You have angels gliding across the stage in the Sugar Plum Fairies Kingdom. I mean, it's just so many different treats for people of all ages. Mm. I could never do ballet when I was little. Is there one little twirl or dance move you can show me? Sure. Okay, I'm gonna give it my best shot. Just give it like a little shuffle, that's right. And then you go side to side. Not as magical, but it's a, it's a moment. <laughs> Next, I twirled over to Woolman Rink in Central Park. Come on, let's skate. And enjoyed the bright lights in a New York City pedicab. Jingle all the way. To keep the spirit going, I stopped by Frosty's Christmas Bar in Times Square. Just stepped into a Christmas fairyland. A holiday destination decked out in ribbon, tinsel, and cocktails from the North Pole. Tis the season. Holiday markets like Bank of America's Winter Village at Bryant Park are a festive way to spend the day. We plan to browse around the shops and see uh, what gifts we can pick up and probably get a hot drink and just enjoy the ambience. You can buy things that are so different. 170 vendors sell their unique gifts and I wandered into one of their shops. Coco Puzzles uses original illustrations to promote inclusivity and diversity. And it's inspired by your daughter. It is inspired by my daughter. Love it. In the spirit of the holidays, I'm going to give away my Christmas wish to others. I've got Nutcracker tickets and a bunch of $200 gift cards. Let's spread the love. You just got engaged. It's your birthday. Yes. And it's the holidays. It's yes. But it's our first Christmas together as well, so we're kind of starting a tradition now. I'd like to make your Christmas that much more special. So I'm going to give you tickets to George Balanchine's The Nutcracker. Oh, wow. What do you think of that? Oh, yeah, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> are you guys excited about the holidays? Oh, yeah. yeah. What are you most excited about? My birthday. Your birthday? <laughs> Guess what? I'm one of Santa's helpers. Yes, I'm sort of an elf, yeah. So I want to give you guys a $200 gift card. Yeah! What do you most look forward to for the holidays? Uh, I'm looking forward to going to my grandma's house and eating turkey legs. <laughs> that sounds pretty good. <laughs> Waking up in the morning and having um, pre opening presents with my family. Aww. Okay, now I have to tell you a little secret. I work with Santa. And Santa told me to give you guys a $200 <gasps> gift card. Tis the season for holiday movies. We'll introduce you to the woman behind some of your favorites. That's right after the break. the boost it's that time of year people enjoying all those holiday rom-coms and while many of the stories center around Christmas one woman decided it was time to show Hanukkah some love Chanel Jones has that story I grew up in an observant Jewish home we observed all the holidays we traveled to Israel I was immersed in my Jewish world and upbringing 
Here at Jean Meltzer's home in Herndon, Virginia, it's beginning to look a lot like Hanukkah. But ever since she was little, Jean has had one forbidden love. I am a nice Jewish girl who has always loved Christmas. How can you not love the beauty of Christmas? There's the lights, there's the music. It's about joy and family and chunky sweaters and hot chocolate. And so it's just a very magical time. It just fills me with joy. But amid all the Christmas cheer, Jean started to feel a little left out. As I got older, I would go to bookstores and I would always see that one table with Christmas romances on it. And every year I would go and look for a Hanukkah romance and there never was one. So I just decided to write it myself. It's called The Matzah Ball, about two childhood flames from Jewish summer camp reunited years later for a big Hanukkah event. She wanted to scoff aloud at his chiseled chin, the disturbingly sexy shape of his gorgeous and prominent nose. Instead, her heart only beat faster. Jacob Greenberg had morphed into a full-grown and totally kosher stud muffin. Writing romance is always a blast because you get to experience the love, the first tensions, the excitement. I knew I wanted to write a Jewish romance and I knew I wanted it to be a Hanukkah romance. For Jean, part of the fun was writing much of herself into the book's main character, a young Jewish author who's secretly obsessed with Christmas. She loved everything about Christmas, the music, the throw pillows, the decor. It brought her to this place of unapologetic joy where nothing bad ever happened and everyone found their happy ending. My family was more observant, so for observant Jewish families, you don't celebrate Christmas in any form. I would like try to sneak uh, little green construction paper Christmas trees and my mom would come and tear them down. Sorry, mom. And uh, um, I would tape up my socks to the windows, hoping that Santa would arrive. And sadly, Santa never came. Something else Jean shares with her protagonist, a life-changing battle with chronic illness. Rachel wanted to fall in love. She wanted to get married, find her person. But who would love her with CFS? I was diagnosed with ME-CFS, myalgic encephalomyelitis, chronic fatigue syndrome, at 18, 19 years old. And as the years have progressed, I have basically become homebound and disabled. 75% of people uh, cannot work full-time with my disease, and 25% are actually bedbound. And I had an incredible opportunity to write what we experience on a page for people who might have no experience with chronic illness. Since it came out, the book has won praise from everyone, including one very important fan. My mom cries every time I call her. She's so happy, and there is nothing like hearing your mom like spell, you know what I mean? So even though I have to talk about how she ripped down my green construction paper <laughs> for Christmas tree, she's very proud. As for her own love story, Jean found it with her husband, Jeff. And with the matzo ball's success, she already has more books in the works to keep the menorah fire burning. I never thought this book was gonna get published. The way it's been accepted has just been beyond my wildest dreams. It's a Hanukkah miracle. <laughs> Speaking of holiday movies, we're about to introduce you to a woman who writes them all year long. She is known as Christmas Karen, and for her, Christmas, it's a year-round endeavor. Joe Fryer's back with her story. We barely know each other. I've never been more certain of anything. For so many, those made-for-TV holiday movies are Christmas comfort food, with ideas cooked up by writers like Karen Shaler. I think right now with everything going on in the world and all the negativity, we need these Christmas movies and novels as an escape, something feel good, something we can watch with our families, and that's why people are gravitating toward them. In a span of just 18 months, Karen wrote three of those Christmas movies, oh yeah, and three Christmas novels, a prolific feat earning her the nickname Christmas Karen. It's 24-7, so I feel like I'm living in Christmas all the time. Having Christmas year-round. Is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? I sort of went down the Christmas rabbit hole a couple years ago, and I tell people I pop my head back up and look around and see what's happening in the world and go, okay, I'm, I'm going back down. I'm happier down here. And I do a little Christmas Karen walk. We caught up with Karen in New York in front of the Met Museum's Christmas tree, a soaring 20-foot blue spruce that perfectly reflects her spirit. 
for you, Christmas is in your blood, right? I just found out from my grandma that my great aunt was born on Christmas Day and her siblings named her Mary, M-E-R-R-Y, middle name Christmas, and their last name was Day. And so she's in Ripley's Believe It or Not for being named Merry Christmas Day. Yeah, caught me doing a little research here. A former journalist, she put her reporting skills to work a few years ago before writing her first Christmas movie. I watched all the Hallmark movies and Lifetime movies. I sat there with a notepad. The first break is at 18 minutes. The first kiss is here. They have to have a near miss kiss. Hey, no fraternizing with the enemy! You know, I, I really studied it. That research inspired her to write A Christmas Prince. Aren't you worried they're all talking about us? They're saying you're out of my league. The popular romantic comedy set in the fictional land of Aldovia was streamed on Netflix in 2017, introducing younger folks to the genre. The different generations, like, what is this cheesy, crazy, silly, ridiculous movie? You acknowledge they're a little bit cheesy, right? I say it's uplifting and heartfelt, but if somebody says, Karen, that movie's cheesy, I'm like, if that means uplifting and heartfelt, yeah, you call it whatever you want. Just watch it and read it. <laughs> Next came a Lifetime film, Every Day is Christmas. You remember being that much in love? Like so many movies, it was inspired by A Christmas Carol with Tony Braxton channeling Scrooge. I took away their Christmas bonuses because they didn't meet their goals. Then Hallmark tapped her to write her third movie, Christmas Camp, about an ad executive who's sent to a rural retreat for a holiday attitude adjustment. They even take her phone. It's called Disconnecting to Reconnect to Christmas. That prompted Karen to create a real-life camp featuring all kinds of Christmas-themed classes. Now more books and movies are on the horizon. My toy-building elves in Santa's workshop, Christmas Karen keeps on going. A Yuletide assembly line. Your world is 12 months of Christmas yeah. a year, and you're good with that, right? It's an honor to do what I do. It's a big responsibility. But Christmas 24-7 works for me. I love it. And as long as I can keep bringing people joy, I'm not stopping. Coming up, we're sharing some of our favorite holiday traditions. Stay with us. Here on the boost as we get ready for tonight's big tree lighting it is one of our favorite traditions and savannah al craig carson and i brought some of our other favorites to studio 1a even one of our own oh looky looky there she is our tree is always puny and so we do a really elaborate lighting one <gasps> wow get ready two one ah you gotta have white lights because it speaks to Christmas and it feels like peace. The kids make their own ornaments. That's done. Let's start with Haley. A little hopey. 
You gotta have lots of tinsel. There's a technique. You take a lot of it and you just keep throwing it in blobs. It's gotta look like it's dripping with beautiful icicles. I need a little help. Carson, can you help me out with some lights? Thanks, Hoda. Oh, no, no, not white lights. There you go. No, 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 no. Here's some lights for the tree. It's only colored lights. What kind of person would put white lights on a tree? I mean, I know it looks fancy. Christmas shouldn't be fancy and elegant. It should be festive and fun. Have yourself a merry little Christmas. Grab this book right here. It's always under the tree. It's called A Special Gift. And my father would read it, and all of us would sit around him. Now that my dad's not here, I have carried on the legacy of reading this book on Christmas Eve. We like to hang a stocking with all of ours. That's camouflage, and we do it in honor of the troops who are overseas and couldn't get back home for Christmas. We'll put this one front and center as a reminder. Ornaments, Craig, you can start with these. All right, well, thanks, Carson, but we actually use a pickle ornament. We also started hiding the pickle in the tree, and one of the kids will find the pickle, they get a surprise, and then we hide the pickle again. Baby Jesus there. Happy birthday to you. When we were dating, this is our first Christmas together. Dinner's over, out comes the birthday cake, and these people begin singing happy birthday to Jesus. I was in, and ever since, we've been singing happy birthday to Jesus. Happy birthday, baby Jesus. Happy birthday to you. Savannah, I believe this is for you. Thanks, Craig. I always like to put something a little sweet on the tree. We used to love having candy canes on the tree, and by the time Christmas rolled around, all the candy canes were gone. Put it up high so the kids don't get all of them. I love Christmas tree ornaments that have a sense of humor and have some personality. A Christmas cactus, because I'm from Arizona. I like ornaments that are kind of weird, honestly. Here's a New York City taxi cab and a little pretzel. The weirder, the better. And look at this fancy little flamingo right up front. One thing I started doing was making a photo ornament of the kids every year. And I love opening the ornament box and seeing how they've grown in a year. Here's our family. Oh, there's our family, our Today Show family. Tree looks good. Al, you gotta finish it off. Ooh, well, I can never get it untangled. Our tree topper is a beautiful black angel. Almost there. You don't feel it's Christmas until she's on top of the tree. Yay! We got some ornaments that represent these beautiful black angels. I'm going to put the angel right next to the baby Jesus. We've done the ugly Christmas sweater. We've done the ugly Christmas suits. Even if you don't want to wear an ugly Christmas sweater, you can always put one on your tree. Bad taste is always timeless. Really looks lovely, but something's missing. Oh, there's, there's no pine scent. The scent, you know, especially when you cut it down and you've got the, the pine sap on your hands. Nick and I have been going out cutting a tree since he's been about six or seven. We're kind of lumberjacks and we go out and we put on flannel shirts. Got our tree, right? Yeah, we did. I stole these out of a New York City cab. That says Merry Christmas. <laughs> We all have our favorite songs around Christmas time. You might even have yours playing right now in the background. But did you know how Christmas carols came to be? NBC's Kelly Cobiella is giving us a look at their origin and some of our favorite sounds of the season. In a small medieval city in Cornwall, Southwest England, at the historic Truro Cathedral, the sound of Christmas. The legendary cathedral choir singing the story of the birth of Christ. That famous service familiar to so many started here in tiny Truro more than a hundred years ago when carols weren't sung in church. They were singing them in just out in their, their own homes, in pubs, in the streets. They just, you know, they, they was a, a culture that had uh, gone very much out of the churches and, and into, the, into the wild. A local bishop hoping to lure very merry revelers away from pubs and ale and back to church replaced sacred music with the people's songs, carols, and the crowds followed. 
Nine Lessons and Carols. Many of the songs we know as Christmas carols have pagan roots, tunes to teach and share for those who couldn't read or write. Lots of carols began as songs to teach a story to a child. So lots of them are very simple, memorable tunes. Children and musically challenged correspondents. Now the holly bears a berry that's... As white as the milk. As white, uh, I don't remember the tune part. Right. <laughs> this is the carol in its full glory. This carol, Sans Day, originated in Cornwall, and like so many Christmas carols, spread far and wide beyond England's shores, passed on by sailors and travelers. Some carols change along the way. This is how O Little Town of Bethlehem sounds in Britain, but we sing it like this. Same words, but completely different melody. In Truro, the choir boys and girls spend their early mornings and late afternoons learning dozens of carols to be perfectly tuned for the Christmas crowds. Are you nervous? A little bit, yeah. <laughs> They've rehearsed to be ready for the big day. It's the music we've heard countless times, yet every year, come back for more. We know them. We know them so uh, well. They're part of our DNA. Songs that say it's Christmas. For Sunday Today, Kelly Cobiella, True Rope, England. Coming up, we got the latest viral video. It'll boost your day. That's right after this. We've got time for one more story, and this one, it'll leave you with a smile. Take a look. More proof this morning that a little kindness can go a long, long way. A woman was flying with her service dog named Munchie, <laughs> when the woman next to them noticed the dog seemed uncomfortable. So guess what? She gave up her pillow, gave it to Munchie. Aww. Munchie's cozy. She even put her arm around them as if it were her own dog. Munchie's owner called the woman her angel. That's it for today. We hope we were able to start your day off with a boost of holiday cheer, and we'll end it with more during our annual tree lighting, Christmas in Rockefeller Center. We'll see you then, and we're back tomorrow with more of The Boost right here on Today All Day.
morning. Welcome to today. Every day. We are adding to the star power in our studio. The biggest names only on today. See, we're coming in this early, right? Everybody, it's today. It's today. Like I won the lottery. How do you feel at this age, this stage? Liberated. We're just getting started, folks. Ain't no stop with us now. The boys are back in town. The boys are back in town. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. This has been fantastic. Everything and everyone you're talking about. Only on today. there guys welcome to the boost let's kick things off with a little holiday cheer as we go behind the scenes with the radio city rockettes and two sisters who are fulfilling their dreams doing those famous high kicks side by side for so many of the radio city rockettes before they were dancing on the stage they were watching from the audience including jordan and danielle betcher you probably get this a lot, but are you sisters? <laughs> we, we are sisters, yes. yes. <laughs> Danielle, the oldest, remembers seeing the Christmas Spectacular with her grandpa when she was 13. And he must have seen that look on my face of just like pure joy because he leaned in and he goes, you know, someday you could do that if you wanted to. 10 years ago, she did. And seven years ago, her sister did. This year, for the first time, they're right next to each other on the kick line. I just know that she has my back both on and off stage. Danelle Morgan also has their backs. Old Saint Nick will ride the She's a swing, ready to step in when someone is out. It's an incredibly challenging job. We don't just learn the one track that a single rockette will do in the show. We learn the entire show. Sometimes do you only have like a moment's notice before you have to jump in? There have been times where it's mid-show and then all of a sudden we're on the stage. An 18-year rockette vet, she knows her parents could be in that audience. They pop up and they show up in the front row for a show where I'll, I'll hear my dad cheering and I'm like, oh my gosh, my parents are here. They didn't tell me they're here, but they're here, okay. So your parents don't always warn you that they're coming? Oh no, they don't always warn me. I can see my mom's glasses reflecting with the lights and it's just really special to know that there's love coming at me while I'm performing. Reminder, the Rockettes are not just in sync with each other, but with you too. Joe Fryer, NBC News, New York. Okay, Santa, we know you have your famous list, but we have one of our fave follows too. It's our fave follows list, and we are officially adding Santa J. Claus to it. Let's take a look at how he's spreading cheer on social media. You know him, you love him, it's Santa Claus. Old St. Nick, a hero to kids, has spent decades as a fixture of pop culture from parades to movies. But now, to spread the holiday spirit to yet another generation of good boys and girls, Santa has gone to TikTok with the handle Santa J. Claus. Showing off everything from his dance moves to what he does in the off season. His food reviews. Look how large that cookie is. I need this cookie. An outfit to the day. Christmas spirit activate. To his work with St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Santa J. Claus carries the Christmas spirit all year round. Good morning, Baltimore. With more than 4.5 million followers, Santa's got a very long list to check this year. Are you on the nice list? certainly are on the nice list. And with the big day approaching, he's taking a break from his busy season and getting his reindeer in formation because Santa J. Claus is coming to town to visit with us. Santa J. Hi, Santa J. Hello there, my friend. Santa J, we're so happy you're here. How did you figure TikTok out, Santa J? It took quite a while, all of the technologicals, my friend, but we gave it a try and it seemed to do quite well. And why did you feel like you wanted to take your Christmas magic yeah. to the talk? Well, I think that I was seeing some of the things you were seeing the young people posting. I think mm -hmm. they needed a reminder of some positivity and goodness. You know what? People are always saying that you make them feel joyful. So there's something special, because I think we all can do a little of that somehow. What's the secret to spreading joy? Well, I think for the most part, it's the opportunity to uplift those that are around you. What mm. a wonderful gift it is. Having the gift giver's heart to brighten someone's day. And I'm able to do it with a simple little video and make them smile. What a <laughs> wonderful thing. 
Yeah, and you also help in a lot of different ways. We talked about in the piece, you help with St. Jude's Children's Hospital, which mm -hmm. we adore. How has that been for you as mm -hmm. a helper? A wonderful opportunity to be able to be an ambassador for St. Jude. They are doing so many wonderful things. And every time I visit there, I'm always inspired by what they're doing. And it's not just that, but charities from all around the world make a wish also a wonderful thing to support. Mm -hmm. We were surprised to read, Santa Jay, that you are a trained opera singer. My goodness, well, I love to sing a little. Well, I don't know about training. Mrs. Claus has been working on this one for me. Well, you can, but you are actually Performing. going to sing at the Grand Ole Opry, aren't you, on the day before Christmas Eve? I am on December 23rd. I cannot wait. A little singing on the Grand Ole Opry stage. It will be my debut in Nashville. How fun oh, is that? Wow. Now, you know, this is a type of year when people can get a little stressed out. Yep. Uh, maybe the opposite of carefree. Yeah. I wonder, how do you keep things balanced? Santa during your busy time? Well, I think cookies are involved. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think it's an opportunity to be able to continue to remind yourself of the good that's around you. Sometimes we can get a little overwhelmed by the world and taking a moment to see that there is goodness always to be found is such a wonderful thing. Are, we have a question for you, Santa. Certainly. And we're scared uh, to ask We're it. afraid because we, maybe the answer is not yeah. great. Are we on the nice list or well, the naughty list? My friends, Hoda and Jenna, certainly on the nice list. Oh, oh, it's, it's definitely for you, my friends, going to be a carefree Christmas. Oh, <laughs> Santa, Santa Jay Santa, knows you like song. our song, Santa the Jay? The elves cannot stop singing it in the <laughs> workshop, my friends. What a wonderful thing. Oh, and you know what? If, they, if we can keep the elves carefree, we can keep anybody yeah, carefree. Yeah, we can. Thank, thank you, Santa thank Jay. You. Okay, we know that you are famous, of course, but we would like to add you to our fave follows list. Is that okay? Certainly, my friend. All okay, right. We're adding it to you. Thank, thank, you, thank you so much. Thank you, my friends. After the break, it's New York's hottest new attraction, and we were the first to try. Stay with us. Rock's newest attraction gives visitors the chance to recreate an iconic photo at the top of the rock. And Team Today was invited to be the very first guests. Check it out. Check it out, guys. We're going up there oh, to wow. the top of the rock. Yeah. All the way to the top. You know Woo. what's up there? What? The beam. Let's go oh. beam. Oh. Getting on the beam. It was just a short walk across the street from Studio 1A. Wait. Yeah, let's go. Going up to be the very first guests to beam ourselves up to the latest experience in Rockefeller Plaza. To the beam, 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 beam. beam. The beam refers to a steel beam that became part of one of the most iconic photographs in American history. 11 iron workers dangling more than 850 feet high above the city, casually eating lunch. The construction of Rockefeller Center is complete and John D. Rockefeller Jr. will drive the last rivet. The year was 1932, the height of the Great Depression, and this construction project, eventually known as Rockefeller Center, put more than 40,000 people to work when jobs were hard to come by. The photo, called Lunch Atop a Skyscraper, came to symbolize American resilience and an ode to the American worker. 
Oh, here we go. Get ready. And we were on the way to pay our own tribute of sorts to the 69th floor of 30 Rock, to that very same location the original photo was taken. This new adventure is called The Beam. Is that The Beam? This is it? That's a beautiful piece of metal right there. And soon we were strapped in. This is like being on a ride at Universal. Yeah. Hands up! Yeah. Come on, let's go! Because to recreate that famous photo, oh. Oh. we have to be lifted high into the air. So Here we go. Far, so good. And then something we don't expect. We turn. Oh, yeah! Oh, baby! Carson, how are we doing? We're doing good. SG? Oh, wow. Now we go out over the... We're not really. No, it does not. No, it doesn't. And, oh, yes, we turn again. Oh, now we're going back! Oh, that's great. And now we're in position to try and capture that famous moment. We felt like we were beaming, but something was missing. If those brave iron workers were having lunch, so were we. Would you want to eat lunch up here? We were going back up. So what do you guys think about this experience? Would you like to meet at this place for lunch again? Sure. <laughs> I think we should do the show from up here. I think it's a great lunch wow. spot. Mm -hmm. I think it's perfect. Carson, how are you? The view is tremendous. Mm -hmm. You all right? It makes you think about hardworking Americans back almost 100 right. years ago. Yeah. yeah. And the idea what this, build, this yeah. building is still standing. Yeah. yeah. And I got news for the people at home watching this. The beam underneath us, not that wide. No. No, it's not. Not that wide. No. 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 But this is special. Mm -hmm. Go back in time. Cheers, guys. Cheers. 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 again in 80 years. Cheers. There you go. During the holiday season, a lot of us look forward to time at home, and Craig's family decided to give an old family home a makeover, but not for themselves, for families in need. What makes a house a home? This small, one-level house outside Columbia, South Carolina, has been in my family for generations. It was actually built by my great-grandmother in 1950. It was also the first home my mother ever knew, staying here right after she was born. This was your first house, right? It was. This was where I came home to with my mom, who was an 18-year-old mother. My mom's family moved out, and my Aunt Margaret lived in the house for decades. For folks who don't know, what was Aunt Margaret like? Aunt Margaret was fun. She didn't have any children, so she made sure that we had stuff. Over the years, we spent many happy times here on Sundays after church or on holidays. But Aunt Margaret had a lot of health issues. After she died, we realized the house was going to be sold at a court-ordered auction to settle unpaid medical bills. We couldn't let that happen. So we bought the house as a Mother's Day gift for my mom to keep it in the family. Together, we decided it could serve a greater purpose. We decided to lease it to a nonprofit called Family Promise for 25 years for a dollar a year. Family Promise provides transitional housing to families in need. Jeffrey Armstrong is the executive director of the local chapter of Family Promise. What a gift like this does is has a ripple effect because it allows families to remain together. So you don't have the, the mother or father figuring things out while the children stay in different places. Before anyone could move into the house, it needed work, a lot of work. My family paid for the project and dozens of local businesses and organizations helped to renovate the house. To say they took it down to the studs would be an understatement. Over a series of months, they redid everything. Oh my goodness, Craig. When you walked in for the first time, what'd you think? I started crying. I just, I just started crying. Cause I, mm, it's more than I could have imagined. I cried a little bit too. This is a lot of memories. Now it was time for some new families to make memories here. My mom and I were there to welcome the first to move in, Jamila Buchanan with her 15-year-old son, Jakai, and five-year-old daughter, Jania. They moved to Columbia from Tennessee last March and had been living in shelters and in churches until they found family promise. Oh my God. Hey! 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 hey. <laughs> We took them on a tour of their new home, each child with a room of their own. Oh, look at your room, Janelle. This is so pretty. 
the little touches making them feel at home. A welcome change from the past few years. What's the last few years been like for, for you? What's it been like for them? My steady, you know, um, being that I was raised like that, I think it kind of followed me throughout my adulthood, you know. Stability is important. Very. <laughs> and were you having a hard time um, finding a place to live? Yes. When we moved here, I was wanting to find a place within a couple of months, but it didn't work out that way. So that's when I called Family Promise. And they were like angels. Yes. <laughs> God sent. <laughs> Come on, princess. The angels were with us when we all found one last surprise in back of the house, a playset with a plaque to honor my late niece, Jasmine, who died of cancer at the age of three. Ready? A reminder that nothing is more precious than family, no place more important than home. <laughs> Higher? Higher? Coming up next, we'll meet a chef on a mission, how he's helping men rebuild their lives through pizza. That story right after this. boost with the life-changing mission behind a Philadelphia pizza shop. Al got to see how they are serving up second chances. Growing up in West Philadelphia, Chef Michael Carter was always cooking alongside his grandmother. You know, he who's in the kitchen gets to taste it first. Ah. <laughs> but his plans to attend culinary school were derailed when he found himself behind bars, convicted for armed robbery and sent to a juvenile detention facility at 16 years old. You were getting in some trouble. What was what was happening? Me and my mother, we basically we weren't getting along, and I ended up getting kicked out. So I kind of ended up running the street. What do you remember of that time? You know, if you don't work, you don't eat. So I had to do a couple things that ended up on the other side of the law. From there, Mike spent a total of 12 years in and out of incarceration, convicted for various felonies, but he always managed to find work in the prison kitchens. Is that where you start actually developing kitchen skills? That was the first place I ever understood a culinary kitchen outside of the kitchen that I was raised in. So now I'm understanding how to do culinary math because instead of just cooking for, say, me and my siblings, now I'm cooking for everybody on grounds. And then once I was in the penitentiary, I'm cooking for 2,000 people a day. With the dream of a cooking career still burning bright, he trained in culinary management after his release in 2013. What was it about food that you realized, I can feed people and I can make money? And they say, do what you love to do. Mm -hmm. So I, I love to eat and I love to cook. It just made absolute sense. 
Mike working his way up in kitchens and catering companies all over Philadelphia until he was introduced to Muhammad Abdul Hadi, also formerly incarcerated and looking to open a pizza shop with a purpose. Slinging pies and saving lives. Down North is a mission-based for-profit pizzeria where every single one of my guys is a father. They're all returning citizens. People often say, do your crime, do your time. And then these guys come home to no resources, no jobs available, so how are they actually gonna be the men who they are? Down North Pizza is hoping to improve upon Pennsylvania's nearly 65% recidivism rate by exclusively hiring formerly incarcerated men. We big on the resources here. They have access to a lawyer. We have housing for our guys. If we can't house you, we could point you in the right direction. So we have guys that we actually have placed in kitchens throughout the city. Mike serving as both executive chef and role model of the restaurant's purpose. Myself, as well as our founder and every single employee that I have has been through it, but they didn't let that define them. They used it as either motivation or they use it as inspiration to move on to the next step in their lives. All while conjuring up school lunch, pan pizza nostalgia with each of his funky square slices. Tell me about the menu. We don't have a menu, we have a track list. It's basically the soundtrack to our youth in Philadelphia. And with the youth on his mind, Mike started a new program for inner city kids with a cooking class at the Philadelphia Juvenile Justice Services Center, hoping to lay the groundwork towards a different future for the next generation. We're actually teaching these kids how to cook, getting them involved. We actually have a healing garden there too. And they get to grow the food. And in my class, you get to cook the food. So it's like a farm to table situation. Mm -hmm. So you're using food in a way to get them to come out of their comfort zone. Exactly. Try something out of the box and that may potentially be good for you. What do you hope kids take away from your classes? I just want them to be open to a different life than they were born into. I'm hoping my class serve as a key to open up that door to actually leave your neighborhood and see what you really can become once you explore the world. As the saying goes, not all heroes wear capes. NBC's Kaylee Hardtongue met the hardworking heroes supporting the NFL's Baltimore Ravens on the sidelines, an elite group that is always ready to serve. In the city of Baltimore, these heroes are working double duty. When you guys first became firefighters, did you ever imagine the role that the Ravens could come to play in your life? No, not at no, all. Not at all. David K. Mack, Frank Thomas, and Jawan Yancey are three of 23 Baltimore firefighters who work part-time for the Ravens support team on their days off from the firehouse. How similar is the mentality that it takes to be a firefighter? What's required of this job? I think it, run, it runs hand in hand. No one's bigger than the team. It's all a group effort. So we all have to jump in there for that win, whether it be here or at the firehouse. The tradition started in 1996 when the Baltimore Ravens franchise first began. The team didn't have a huge budget to hire full-time employees, so local firefighters volunteered to help. And 26 years later, they've never left. In a week, how long is the list of to-dos for you guys here? How long do we have? <laughs> yeah. Starts from 6 a.m. up to 8.30 at night some nights. Welcome to the heart of our fireman operations for the Ravens. This is where we do all the laundry, game days, and practices. We have some game day pants here. We go dig into, we get right to work. Got a blood stain remover. We got blood, we got grass stains. Not to mention the sweat. I'm trying not to get too close. Yeah. Whose pants are these? So this is uh, Ben Cleveland. He's our one of our tackles, massive man. Ben Cleveland, you're welcome. The guys say on a white pants week, it's a seven step process to get them clean. Roquan Smith, heart and soul of the defense, and some of the dirtiest pants in this pile. <laughs> What's a tougher assignment? Putting out a fire or getting the stains out of some of those dirty uniforms? I would definitely say the stains. <laughs> On Sunday night in Los Angeles, those Ravens uniforms were looking crisp. The firefighters side by side with the players at SoFi Stadium wrestling the players' gear on, and shagging practice balls moments before kickoff. And the morning after a game, they're right back at the firehouse. By the way, that man who was helping me with the laundry, Jawan Yancey, he's chief of his firehouse. What's your favorite part about getting to be a part of the Ravens organization? Not to sound sappy, but like these guys. It's kind of like a deep breath for us when you get to hang out with your friends and your favorite team.
And Chief Yancey is one of the only Raven staff members entrusted with this job, breaking in the footballs for the most accurate kicker in NFL history, Justin Tucker. You take the end of the brush and you want to get all the nubs off the football. Smooth it out. Yep, you want a smooth kicking surface. Lucky for you, Justin Tucker doesn't really miss. Yeah. Yeah, well, I probably wouldn't have a job. You have played a very important role in that through his career. A small part. He Come works here. hard. He works hard. The Ravens players know the sacrifice these firefighters make for their city and how valuable they are to this team. Patrick Queen is one of the Ravens' fiercest linebackers. Everything they do for us is just it's so greatly appreciated. I mean, like, this place really wouldn't be functioning the way it functions without them. Do you have any idea how long it takes them to get grass stains and blood stains out of your uniform after a game? I have no idea, but I'm pretty sure it's a long time. How cool is that for you guys just to be surrounded by men of this caliber? Well, one thing, if the building catch on fire, I know who to go to for one. <laughs> <laughs> so, firefighters have a motto, never say no. How does that apply here? We pride ourselves on fixing the problem and helping out. Situation comes comes along, we just, you know, shift gears and go in that most, go in that direction. And these Baltimore firefighters are always ready to serve their city, saving the day on the field and saving lives off of it. We've got another fun story coming up that is right after the break. We got some more feel-good stories for you. Take a look. There's no place <laughs> like home for the holidays. And here's more proof. So Chloe Colton had been living in Australia for a little more than a year. So she wanted to surprise her parents because she's going to fly home for Christmas. Her brother picked her up from the airport. And here's what happened when she walked in the door. Chloe, do you miss me then? <laughs> <laughs> That's complete shock. <laughs> That's when you're not clear if it's a dream or not. Yeah. Then the tears, the tears start flowing. Chloe's parents overwhelmed. These are the memories that oh. they'll take forever. Oh, how awesome. I love that moment Your where yeah, it's yeah. like they saw a ghost. Yeah, that's like, exactly you right. look like my daughter. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Still wow. Cool. That's great. Yep. Thank you so much for joining us here on The Boost. We hope we made your day a little bit brighter. And we will see you back here tomorrow on Today All Day.
Every morning, get into the holiday spirit with today. We're going to spread some holiday cheer. Some added inspiration to give back this holiday season. We are launching today's toy drive. Holiday gifts for everybody on the list. That is delicious. Our biggest holiday crowd I'm yet. Make today your home for the holidays. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. Every day. We are adding to the star power in our studio. The biggest names only on today. See, we're coming in this early, right? Hey, buddy, it's today. Like I won the lottery. How do you feel at this age, this stage? Liberated. We're just getting started, folks. Ain't no stop with us now. The boys are back in town. <laughs> Back in town, it's a miracle. It's a miracle. This has been fantastic. Everything and everyone you're talking about, only on today. Hi, guys, welcome to the booth. Today's show is full of heartfelt stories from families finding connections at St. Jude's to a remarkable adoption story. But first, Dylan is sharing one of her favorite holiday traditions, taking us along for the ride as her family searched for that perfect Christmas tree. Brian, the boys, and I took a trip to Elwood Pumpkin and Christmas Tree Farm in search of the perfect pine to enjoy throughout the holiday. We've got Lee here. Hey, Lee. What do you recommend? Where do we start? A lot of people make a mistake at a big tree farm like this. They, they choose the nicest tree, but they don't think about longevity. I mean, these, these not only are they tall, but they're perfectly shaped and they're absolutely beautiful. That doesn't happen by accident. Every one is perfect. But I want a big one. Brian, we have a ceiling. I'm going to go full Griswold. Cal, tell him I'm gonna get the biggest one, okay? Cal, don't listen to him, buddy. This happens to be a Norway spruce. It's what they use in Rockefeller Center. I'm sure you see, have seen that tree, right? <laughs> According to Lee, spruce trees are more likely to lose their needles as time passes, especially without proper care. I've had people that want them and say they have success with it. It didn't take long before we fell in love with a tree. Oh. Remember this tree. But we wanted to look around before deciding. I like the height, but it might be a little skinny. All right. You don't think it's a little too short? Well, I guess it's not too short for you. Well, you know the hard part now? We have to cut it down. It was Brian's time to shine as he took on the task of chopping down our tree. Can we get a stunt double? <laughs> Look at Daddy cutting down a tree. The whole tree's wobbling. Oh, here it goes. Oh, there it goes. Come on, guys, help me. Help me, help me. Tree, pull the tree. Uh, you you did it! Yeah! <laughs> Is this the first time you ever cut a tree? Yes. Sure. Sure. Hands. No calluses. <laughs> but the job wasn't done. Here we go. We had to get the tree all the way back to the car. After a while of sitting in our backyard, it was finally time to bring in the tree. Look at this. And upon inspection, we found a little surprise within its branches. There's a bird's nest in here. Ah! <laughs> Are you guys ready for some ornaments? Yeah. One of my favorite family traditions is talking about each of the ornaments as we put them on the tree. Daddy made this when he was little. It's a gingerbread man. Yeah. But on the other side, he burnt the cookie. What? Hey, Calvin. This is a replacement for the one when you threw a football at the tree. Come on, Chef. Whatever you want. I'll hang it on the tree. Right in the front, buddy. Yes? Yeah, put it on the tree. And before we knew it, it was Christmas in the Fishera household. We're done with our tree. There we go. There we go. Nice! Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas! Now, our girl Jenna channeling her inner Santa. It was all to help brighten the holiday season for some remarkable families. Along with the team at Pay Away the Layaway, Jenna gave shoppers the ultimate surprise and made spirits bright. There's holiday magic in the air at Burlington in Brooklyn, New York. And these unsuspecting shoppers have no idea what's in store for them. Guys, I am here in the layaway room where there are thousands of items for over 200 customers. We're gonna surprise them big today and tell them that we are paying off all of their layaway. It's all thanks to Pay Away the Layaway, a nonprofit that collects donations all year long to pay off balances nationwide. 
Since 2011, they've helped out 15,000 families. We've heard so much about so many families struggling this year yeah. and really stretching to make the holiday what they want it to be. Yeah. Executive Director Julie Sullivan paid the bill for every layaway with children's items. Our mission is to inspire hope and spread kindness. A lot of these people don't know if they're going to be able to buy some of these gifts. How do you feel like it spreads joy? When we tell someone that their layaway balance is paid off, we see reactions that span from jumping up and down, clapping, cheering, to breaking down in tears and sobbing. And what we've really come to realize is it's really a stress reliever. Three, two, one. Happy Holidays! I was honored to join the team of Holiday Helpers as we began wrapping toy after toy. Here you go. You're welcome. We quickly got into the holiday spirit. Jingle bells, jingle all the way. It wasn't long before our shopping carts were filled with as many toys as Santa's sleigh. It was time to set up the operation for our big surprise. We placed hidden cameras on towers of toys, disguised our volunteers as store employees. And the most important part, calling in the shoppers. If you could sign in, thank you for coming today. They were invited to the store for what they thought was a promotional event. The crowd made their way back to the layaway counter. It was go time. Are you ready to go out? OK, let's do it. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Hi, everybody. Hi. How are you? I have an announcement. Are you all ready? Yes! OK, well, thanks to pay away the layaway, we have a huge surprise. All of your layaways have been paid off. <laughs> the holiday spirit instantly swept through the store. Please take some pressure off and give toys to some kids. Yes. <laughs> My grandkids. Yes. Your grandkids. Thank you so much. Customers were bursting with joy and also relief. Are you happy? I'm so happy. Does this help? I'm still happy. Help me Who are the presents for? I oh, have my daughter and I have the last couple years. Well, we're glad we could get you presents for your daughter. Baby Tahara also had special items on layaway. What is she getting from here? Oh, I bought her a nightlight and some clothes. A nightlight and some nightlight clothes, clothes to keep her nice and warm. Yeah. Yeah. So does this help y'all? 100, anything, anything else. The store's youngest customer was baby Caden, who is celebrating his very first Christmas. And are there some presents in there for him? Um, some shoes and some stuff. Shoes. He's grateful for it. He's grateful. Oh Merry Christmas to you, baby. Miel's shopping list included toys for her eight grandchildren. It feels so great because there's a lot of strain over Christmas and getting everything together when you have so much loved ones to buy for. Yeah. It's just for overwhelming relief. Overwhelming relief. Do you feel the Christmas spirit? I feel the Christmas spirit now. <laughs> yes, I do. I don't know. Woo! Like dancing. Yeah. <laughs> Making spirits bright in an unexpected place and a beautiful celebration of the season of giving.
We're back on the boost, highlighting the remarkable work being done at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. We have the stories of two families who found hope and one another. Take a look. Imani and Everly are like most four-year-old pals. They enjoy dressing up and playing together. But in their young lives, both girls have already defied the odds and created an extraordinary bond, which began shortly after they were born. The two girls just love each other so much. We love watching them grow together. <laughs> Horam Matabdeen and Sara Syed welcome daughter Imani into the world in November of 2019. It's like a light switch that kind of goes off the moment your child is born. Now you realize that this life is no longer just about you. For the new parents, who are also physicians, their joy turned to deep concern five short weeks later. From day one, she wasn't gaining weight very well. She would look down and, and it was like her eyes would get stuck. Can we just bring her in for a, a scan? As the image is kind of populating on, on the computer screen, I saw this huge tumor kind of show up on the screen. Next thing you know, she's having emergency surgery. We met with the oncologist there and she said, we can try chemo, but it's very unlikely that it's gonna work. I would, I would take her home and just enjoy what time you have with her. But in the meantime, we were kind of sending out her chart to every place we could think of. We brought her home on hospice uh, where she continued to deteriorate at home. And then we bought her burial plot. Then they heard from a doctor at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. We reviewed your daughter's chart. We just got the pathology. Um, this is not a hospice case. Um, we think we can help. It felt like God was speaking through me through that phone call. They packed their bags and immediately flew from New York to St. Jude in Memphis. After several rounds of chemo, Imani underwent another surgery to remove the remainder of the high-grade glioma. Our daughter began to thrive getting chemo. She was gaining weight. She was meeting milestones. As soon as he started the surgery, he was able to remove the whole thing. And I think for the first time, that was when we said, we have a future with our child. I didn't <laughs> Meanwhile, in Austin, Texas, Garrett and Kelsey Ozar were facing a similar battle with their newborn daughter, Everly. Everly had a major brain surgery when she was three days old. She had a very aggressive and rare cancer. The first oncologist told us that we would unlikely make it to her first birthday. My phone rings and it's Dr. Gajar at St. Jude Children's Hospital. And he asked us, what has everybody said to you? And so we told them, and he said, don't listen to a word they're saying. Come to Memphis and, and we're gonna save your daughter. Like Imani, Everly went through six months of intensive chemotherapy. We were in the hospital going through chemotherapy one moment, and then I feel like the next moment, she was having full conversations with us and hitting every milestone. These children not only are just surviving, but they're thriving and growing. And it was a chance encounter by two dads fighting for their daughters that would lead to a much needed friendship. We were leaving a physical therapy session and I saw another dad, and we found out that our daughters are just a few months apart. They had the exact same type of rare cancer. We were able to see another family who's kind of going through the exact same thing you are, and their kid's doing good. I mean, they're part of our family now, where our daughters are best friends. We have coordinated so that we go back for all of our follow-ups together. We get to celebrate these two miraculous kids. Imani and Everly are now thriving, FaceTiming weekly and meeting up for family vacations. So we had a few surprises in store for these BFFs, starting with a reunion at American Girl Place in New York City. <laughs> Yay! We're gonna go around the store and pick out some dolls. You wanna look around? Okay, let's go! And thanks to American Girl, Imani and Everly got to pick out their own dolls and accessories. Look who it is, there's Easton. There you go. Say hi, dolly. I think if you would have told us three and a half years ago that we'd be sitting here at the American Girl store, them having dolls, that would have been the biggest thing in life that like, could have ever been given to us. I mean, this is unbelievable. It's the second best thing that came out of St. Jude. Obviously, the first best thing is them being okay, but the second best thing is having y'all in our family.
Now to a couple who opened their home to more love. Here's more on the surprise phone call that transformed one Texas family forever. My name is Marissa and I am 14 years old. I was adopted from China and I think I was 11 months old. She um, was just a joy. She was just an amazing baby. She was so special. Over the years, she always asked for a sibling. She always wanted a baby sister. We just felt like our family was together. Our family was complete. Or we thought it was complete. <laughs> but nine months ago, Marissa's parents, Dina and Thomas, got a call. There were two boys who had lost both of their parents within five months of each other. They were living with their 77-year-old grandfather, but needed a forever home. I remember the night we sat down and had a little family meeting and we talked about um, what, we, what we were doing, what our plan was, and we asked her how she felt about it. And she started crying, like she was so excited. So that's when we felt like we knew we were doing the right thing. I was excited for this change and I was excited to have someone to hang with. I was expecting them to be girls. We first had a phone call with the boy's grandfather and the phone call went great. And then a couple of weeks later, we actually drove to his house. When we walked up to the door, Levi was jumping up and down because he was so excited to meet us. And I remember at one point I asked Joseph, I said, are you nervous, Joseph? And he said, yeah. I said, you know what, I am too. <laughs> you know, it was kind of a, an emotional day. I was very happy because I could never imagine being a big sister. I've always wanted to be, but I never actually thought I would be. So the oldest one is eight, and he's in third grade. He asks a lot of questions, very inquisitive. The little one is three. He's always moving, always climbing, always jumping, throwing. We have to watch him every minute. <laughs> they add a bunch of energy to the house. They both love her, so. They do. I think she'll be awesome, sister. Right now she is. Her and the little man have really bonded over that relationship. Here we go. Smile. Today is a big day for Marissa and her family, adoption day. Marissa is officially becoming a big sister. And after a lot of heartbreak, her little brothers, Joseph and Levi, are getting a new family. OK. Hi. How are you? Good. Matter before the court is a final adoption. Good looking boys. You were the only boy in the family and you needed boys, is yeah, that right? Yes, I wanted okay. to outnumber the girls. <laughs> so you wanted to step back into being a granddad? Yes. Okay. So you agree this adoption's in the best interest of their child of these yes, children. The court approves the adoption uh, order as proposed and grants this adoption. Thank you. <laughs> I just think there couldn't have been a better couple and family to adopt them. They've been through more than boys should have to be. My hope is that they grow up and feel secure and feel loved. I'm very excited to watch them grow up and make memories with them. I get to be with a new family and I have a new mom and dad and I have a sister. I have an more family members and now I have two families, kind of. That's right, buddy. We're a family. Yeah. When she kept saying she wanted a sister and she wanted a sister, I said, well, you know what? I said, God knows what we need. I really think that's how we all met and, and came together. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, we needed these boys as much as they needed us.
Welcome back to The Boost. If you love music as much as we do, you are going to adore this viral star. He is the host of The Terrell Show, one of the hottest tickets on YouTube. Check it out. It's your boy Terrell. Welcome back to my channel. With his signature blue wall and some of the best vocalists in the world. The Terrell Show on YouTube has become a go-to destination for music's biggest talents. Host Terrell Grice uses his humor, positivity, and his passion for music to not only interview up-and-coming artists and icons. Oh, yeah. Your story. It, I'm like, people don't really know that much about it, but yeah. Okay, we gotta get into this. Yeah, yeah. But also to get them to sing, and I mean sing. Give me the chorus. <laughs> You've gotta do it. <laughs> Never mind, I'll find someone like you. But it wasn't always high notes for Terrell. Ten years ago, ready to change his life, he left his call center job in Orlando, Florida, and drove across the country to Hollywood with $300 to his name and a car he lived in once he got there. His determination earned him jobs in TV production before stepping in front of the camera to start his own YouTube show. Complete with a makeshift green screen and two kitchen stools, the goal throughout to shine a light on talented artists. And it caught on with more than 1.2 million subscribers today. And now stars like Kelly Clarkson, Kiki Palmer, and Kelly Rowland are stopping by and shining the light right back. Oh my so gosh, I, was like, you ate I don't know what down. I'm saying, but I'm saying it. <laughs> you ate that down, honey. It was so good. You are amazing at this. I'll always be here to tell you what light you are. Okay. Oh my oh, gosh. No, no, oh my God. God. Hi, guys. What a beautiful window into your life. I mean, I was just trying to think from your first guest to where you are yes. today. I mean, who was your first guest, by the way? My first guest was an R&B singer named Noah Barless. He was on a show called The Four on Fox way back in the day. And honestly, I did not want to be a host. <laughs> I was never an interviewer. Like, I look at you guys, I'm like, you guys have such a hard job. How do you do this? And I was just talking about music direct to camera by yeah. myself. Yeah. And he calls up and he's like, can I talk about music with you? And I said, oh, okay, um, <laughs> you want me to ask you questions as well? Because I don't do that, but let's try it out. And I guess I'm still trying it out. Well, <laughs> but here's the thing. Yeah. You have a natural curiosity. Yes. Yes. And as Kelly Rowland said, a beautiful light. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that is what mm -hmm. people are attracted to, Man, right? It's so you're right about it. The thing that I love about The Terrell Show is I'm really a fan of all of these people. Yeah. I have a curiosity about everything from mm -hmm. their first album to their last project. Project. I want to know everything. Yeah. And I try to do it in a way that, you know, brings the audience in as well. I think what you're doing sitting in this chair opposite us right now is you're proving that sometimes you can go from nothing, 300 mm. bucks sleeping in your car, to being on a national television show oh and sitting in this chair. But <clears> what <throat> do you think it was that propelled you? Because many people find themselves in dire straits. They just can't figure out the way mm. out. You have to keep your head above water. Yeah. No matter what's going on around you, there could be a fire happening right <laughs> here. I'm going to be like, it's okay, it's okay, because yeah. you have the heart for it. When I was driving from Florida to LA yeah. and it was in the middle of the night, I ran off of the road and I, I woke up from me hitting the median mm -hmm. on my way to LA in Texas. And, you know, I could have been like, you know what? I should turn around. Right. Yeah. I should go this back. Is too much. This is too yeah. much. Yeah. Yeah. But I wasn't going to let anything stop me. Never give up. That's yeah. my motto, no matter what's going on. You know what's amazing is it seems like you have no fear. Mm -hmm. Or you don't let fear yeah. and anxiety yeah. dictate that's, what you're That's better. Like yes, is that's that more it? like it. Is because that it? it is scary. It, you know, it's, this I is I mean, you moved to a, a place. You were living in your car. Yeah. Yeah. You, you didn't have any money. You didn't know anyone. You didn't know anybody. And then also, once you could move out of your car, you were living in a hotel that was called the murder hotel? Uh, that's what I like to call it. <laughs> it's called, um, there's a whole documentary about it. I think yeah. it's called the Hotel Cecil or something. Yeah. Yeah. It was the cheapest hotel I can find, guys. It was like $25 a night. Yeah. I'm like, oh my gosh, I can afford that. 
I should have just stayed in my car. It was <laughs> awful in there. Yeah. But in that hotel, I found a phone book. And I just, you know, was determined to never give up. And I was flipping through the phone book, looking at production companies and calling them, cold calling them, asking for a job. Who said anything? Yes? Who said yes? There was this lady who is a prop master um, for many different shows. And she said no at first. Yeah. But she called me back at night when I was just laying, looking yeah. at the ceiling, just crying my eyes out. And she's like, you know what? There's something about you. Will you come see me in my office at 8.30 in the morning and I'll see what I have for you. I showed up and think like Devil Wears Prada. Yeah. You guys know that movie? Yeah. She barely said a word to me. She just <laughs> escorted me to her warehouse and she's like, organize my pillows. Oh, jeez. I don't even like. I there were a lot of. There were literally there was thousands of and pillows. That's not your thing. It's not my thing. Like, okay. Well, how am I supposed to work this thing? What? I could barely drive across the country without falling asleep. So I said, you know what, Terrell, just just figure it out. I grabbed some baggies, a label maker, and just started going, going, yeah, going. Yeah. Yeah. Eight hours later, she comes in. She inspects my work. She says nothing to me for eight hours. Comes in, expects to work, and she's like, hmm. Pulls out a checkbook, and just starts writing, and hands me a check for three thousand dollars. My gosh been like a jackpot. Two days ago, I was, you know, yeah. in my car, not knowing what to do. But that thing that told me to keep going and never give mm. up, it paid off. Now to the orchestra that draws its notes from the past, and they all play the keyboard, making their own type of music. NBC's Ann Thompson explains. It is a cacophony of clicks and clacks. The music of the Boston Typewriter Orchestra. This is Stomp Meets the Office. Brendan Quigley and Chris Keene lead the Underwoods, Royals, and Smith Coronas, rehearsing at Chris's dining room table. Whose idea was this? Have you ever heard like a song on the radio and go, you know, this song's pretty good, but I think it would sound better not on one typewriter, but eight? No, oh, I've never thought okay. that. Well, oh, okay. well, we have. That's our origin. We heard, uh, you know, Last Christmas by Wham and thought, you know, this would sound a lot better on typewriters, and so mm -hmm. we just did it. If music is noise that makes sense, this is it. What does your sheet music look like? It's a mess. Well, <laughs> <laughs> the goal, not words per minute, but beats and hooks. This is a song without any melody or lyrics, and yet somehow it's still catchy. Hey. The Kelly Clarkson show thought so. What's the next holy grail for you? I don't know, the MGM Sphere in Vegas? Sure, yeah, you know. I mean, what does you 2 need an opening act? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but first, Ralph Steiner in Worcester. Go. By day, Chris is a software engineer. Brendan constructs crossword puzzles. I feel like we're kind of a rock band at heart. We've sort of planted the flag and, you know, everyone has to catch up. One carriage return at a time. It's time for your daily morning boost coming right at you. Check it out.
more proof this morning that just being there for your family or friends means the world to them. So take a look at this little girl. She's at her ballet recital. She doesn't seem that into it. She's just hanging around. And then she finally spots her parents in the crowd. Oh. She lights up like a Christmas tree. Big wave. Oh. And now she's into it. Oh. That smile stayed the whole performance. Everything changed from that point on. A little extra spring in her step. Thank you so much for joining us here on The Boost. We hope we helped you capture the joy of the holiday season. And we cannot wait to spread more cheer and joy tomorrow, right here on Today All Day. Hey, guys, welcome to The Boost. We are fully in the holiday season. We're hoping to make your spirits bright today. So let's start with our very own Jenna Bush Hager channeling her inner Santa. She teamed up with Pay Away the Layaway to help deliver special holiday surprises to some remarkable families. There's holiday magic in the air at Burlington and Brooklyn, New York. And these unsuspecting shoppers have no idea what's in store for them. Guys, I am here in the layaway room where there are thousands of items for over 200 customers. We're gonna surprise them big today and tell them that we are paying off all of their layaway. It's all thanks to Pay Away the Layaway, a nonprofit that collects donations all year long to pay off balances nationwide. Since 2011, they've helped out 15,000 families. We've heard so much about so many families struggling this year yeah. and really stretching to make the holiday what they want it to be. Yeah. Executive Director Julie Sullivan paid the bill for every layaway with children's items. Our mission is to inspire hope and spread kindness. A lot of these people don't know if they're going to be able to buy some of these gifts. How do you feel like it spreads joy? When we tell someone that their layaway balance is paid off, we see reactions that span from jumping up and down, clapping, cheering, to breaking down in tears and sobbing. And what we've really come to realize is it's really a stress reliever. Three, two, one. Happy Holidays! I was honored to join the team of Holiday Helpers as we began wrapping toy after toy. Here you go. You're welcome. We quickly got into the holiday spirit. Jingle bells, jingle all the way. It wasn't long before our shopping carts were filled with as many toys as Santa's sleigh. It was time to set up the operation for our big surprise. We placed hidden cameras on towers of toys, disguised our volunteers as store employees. And the most important part? calling in the shoppers. If you can sign in, thank you for coming today. They were invited to the store for what they thought was a promotional event. The crowd made their way back to the layaway counter. It was go time. Are you ready to go out? Okay, let's, okay. Go. let's do it. Let's go. Let's go. Hi, everybody. Hi. How are you? I have an announcement. Are y'all ready? Yes! Okay, well, thanks to pay away the layaway, we have a huge surprise. All of your layaways have been paid off. <laughs> the holiday spirit instantly swept through the store. Please take some pressure off and give toys to some kids. Yes. <laughs> My grandkids, yes. Your grandkids. Thank you so much. Customers were bursting with joy and also relief. Are you happy? I'm so happy. Does this help? I'm so happy. Help me Who are the presents for? I oh, have my daughter and I have Lara Sophia. Well, we're glad we could get you presents for your daughter. Yeah. Baby Tahara also had special items on layaway. What is she getting from here? I bought her a nightlight and some clothes. A nightlight and some nightlight. clothes to keep her nice and warm. Yes. So does this help y'all? 100, anything, anything else. The store's youngest customer was baby Caden, who is celebrating his very first Christmas. And are there some presents in there for him? Um, some shoes and some stuff. Shoes. He's grateful for it. He's grateful. Oh Merry Christmas to you, baby. Niel's shopping list included toys for her eight grandchildren. It feels so great because there's a lot of strain over Christmas and getting everything together when you have so much loved ones to buy for. Yeah. It's just for overwhelming relief. Overwhelming relief. Do you feel the Christmas spirit? I feel the Christmas spirit now. <laughs> yes, I do. I don't know. Woo! 
like dancing. <laughs> Making spirits bright in an unexpected place and a beautiful celebration of the season of giving. With Christmas almost here, we know Santa's elves are working very hard. Craig Melvin got to meet one of the honorary helpers who's devoted to giving back to her community. Good morning, good morning. At this intersection, Angela Thompson is the bright light. Paris, how was your day? Did you have a better day from this morning? For nearly two decades, she's been helping elementary school students cross the street safely. You get to see these kids grow up. You say hello in the morning. You say goodbye in the afternoon. But it's not just a hello and goodbye for me. In the mornings, I can have a child having a bad day, and I'm always, you know, how can we make your day better? And during this time of year... Let me clock out first. Angela spends her time off the clock spreading holiday cheer. And this one as well is 25% off. By organizing her very own toy drive, shopping for gifts, to give to the children who brighten her day. She is the good caution guard. She'll come out of nowhere just to make sure we get across the street. Let's go back to the beginning of this toy drive. How was this born? There was a young mother, and she was just crying and talking about what she couldn't do for her children. And so I told her, I said, hey, see me next week. So that week when she stopped and saw me, I had all of these gifts and her tears, oh my God, her tears just, it, it, it's just, it touched me. It just made me wonder how many young parents are going through something. Thanks to donations from her family and friends, like her daughter, Asia. Angela makes her list. 337.56. Then checks it twice. This year, Angela and her hardworking elves are wrapping over 70 gifts. Each toy wrapped a gift in more ways than one. I'm helping out because the love for Angie and her passion for what she does. Angela and Santa Claus have a plan. They will deliver the wrap presents to students right here on the last day before winter break begins. I suited up with Angela, stop sign in hand. Oh, we've got one. To meet the kids on her shopping list. Okay. All right, let's go. Here, here we go. go, Craig. We're moving. We go. We're moving, What's up, Craig. Man? You on a nice list or the money list? Hi. <laughs> okay. You look like you're probably on the nice list. Merry All Christmas. All right, Craig, you gotta bring oh, some light back. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you are hilarious. Sorry. Craig, you're gonna get fired on your uh, first uh, day. What, what you the first time? <laughs> you can't get past me. No, no. I'm not losing a kid on my watch. Uh, How was your school day? Uh, yes! Yes! Angela, what happens if you run out of gifts? The time that I did run out of gifts, a good Samaritan stopped and brought me gifts. But this time, we didn't want to take any chances. We took Angela to Fisk Elementary School. This is where those kids we met attend class. Angela had no idea what was waiting for her. Oh, wow. What is wow. this? Wow. Hello. Hi. Y'all know Miss Angela? In honor of your hard work, the folks at Hasbro have decided that they are going to give a gift to every child in this auditorium on your behalf. Santa elves, y'all come on out. Now, let's travel to a small, picturesque town where a very special ice skating rink has transformed daily life in a remarkable way. He's, here's Harry Smith with that story. In these days when it feels like there's more going on that pulls us apart than that which draws us together, we present this contradiction, the brand new ice rink in Springfield, New York. I mean, it's just crazy. It's like this every day here. Galen Cricky is the town supervisor. The day we visited, 
wind chill was six below zero. In this kind of weather, people out here shoveling away and people donating skates. We have 50 pairs of skates and they're all donated. Kids, adults, beginners, all are welcome. And by the looks of it, all are darn happy to be here. How big of a plus has this been for your town? Oh gosh, huge, huge, very big. There's not a lot to do here in the winter. Maggie Picorni teaches middle school and comes here often to unwind. People come and want to get out, you know, after work, after school, get some fresh air. It's a great place to be. It sure looked great to us. And how we wondered did this come to be? A $5,000 budget and a vision. I thought about it for two weeks and it kept nagging at me and nagging at me. And I was nervous because I knew it was going to be a lot of work. But when you have an idea that strong, you can't ignore it. The frozen equivalent of Field of Dreams, says Ashley Sykema, who runs the parks here. When we built it, we started saying, if you build it, they will come. And they came. <laughs> and they keep coming more and more every day. Built in large part by town folk, ultra-capable Amish neighbors who already had ranks of their own. Out of respect for the Amish, we blurred some images. None of them would take any payment. The town offered to pay them and they wouldn't take any payment. And Amish man, Wayne Stutzman, who led the effort, even came up with a backyard version of a Zamboni to keep the ice smooth. Normally, we're out here for at least two, at least. Uh, we're coming up, I think we're actually coming up on four hours now, so. Uh. Benjamin Munyon and his daughter, Bridget, are here most every day. How much do you like coming out to the skating rink? I like it a lot. You like it a lot, I can tell because I see no sign in you four hours in of like, it's time to go, Dad. I don't see anybody. You're not tugging on your dad's sleeve. No. I think we would spend all day out here if we could. It's not fancy, this ice rink, but it seems to function in a way that far exceeds anyone's expectations. When we all get together and we spend time together and we get to know each other and focus on what we have in common, that joy just builds and spreads. Imagine one of these in your town. You know what they say, if you build it. After the break, we're kicking off the holiday season into high gear with sisters who show us just what it takes to be a Radio City Rockette. Stay with us. Welcome back to The Boost. It's Christmas time, and Dylan Dreyer is spreading happiness and cheer by bringing us along with her family to a Christmas tree farm. Take a look. Can you guys believe it's time to get our Christmas tree already? Yeah. Are you so excited? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ryan, the boys, and I took a trip to Elwood Pumpkin and Christmas Tree Farm in search of the perfect pine to enjoy throughout the holiday. We've got Lee here. Hey, Lee. What do you recommend? Where do we start? A lot of people make a mistake at a big tree farm like this. They, they choose the nicest tree, but they don't think about longevity. I mean, these, these not only are they tall, but they're perfectly shaped and they're absolutely beautiful. That doesn't happen by accident. Dave, I love Every one is perfect. I want a big one. Brian, we have a ceiling. I'll go full Griswold. 
Cal, tell me to get the biggest one, okay? Cal, don't listen to him, buddy. This happens to be a Norway spruce. It's what they use in Rockefeller Center. I'm sure you see, have seen that tree, right? <laughs> According to Lee, spruce trees are more likely to lose their needles as time passes, especially without proper care. I've had people that want them and say they have success with it. It didn't take long before we fell in love with a tree. Remember this tree? But we wanted to look around before deciding. I like the height, but it might be a little skinny. All right. You don't think it's a little too short? Yeah. Well, I guess it's not too short for you. Well, you know the hard part now? We have to cut it down. It was Brian's time to shine as he took on the task of chopping down our tree. Can we get a stunt double? <laughs> Look at Daddy cutting down a tree. The whole tree's wobbling. Oh, here it goes. Oh, there it goes. Come on, guys, help me. Help me, help me. Ah, it's like a tree. Pull the tree. Yeah. Is this the first time you ever cut a tree? Yes. Sure. Tree's hands, no calluses. <laughs> but the job wasn't done. Here we go. We had to get the tree all the way back to the car. After a while of sitting in our backyard, it was finally time to bring in the tree. Look at this. And upon inspection, we found a little surprise within its branches. There's a bird's nest in here. <laughs> Are you guys ready for some ornaments? Yeah. One of my favorite family traditions is talking about each of the ornaments as we put them on the tree. Daddy made this when he was little. It's a gingerbread man. Yeah. But on the other side, he burnt the cookie. What? Hey, Calvin, this is a replacement for the one when you threw a football at the tree. Oh, sure. Whatever you want. I'll hang it on the tree. Right in the front, buddy. Yeah? Yeah, put it on the tree. And before we knew it, it was Christmas in the Fischera household. We're done with our tree. There we go. There we go. Nice. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Now let's meet two sisters doing those signature holiday high kicks side by side for the very first time as Radio City Rockettes. NBC's Joe Fryer has their story. For so many of the Radio City Rockettes, before they were dancing on the stage, they were watching from the audience, including Jordan and Danielle Betcher. You probably get this a lot, but are you sisters? <laughs> we, we are sisters, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Danielle, the oldest, remembers seeing the Christmas Spectacular with her grandpa when she was 13. And he must have seen that look on my face of just like pure joy because he leaned in and he goes, you know, someday you could do that if you wanted to. Ten years ago, she did, and seven years ago, her sister did. This year, for the first time, they're right next to each other on the kick line. I just know that she has my back, both on and off stage. Danelle Morgan also has their backs. Old Saint Nick will ride the sky. She's a swing, ready to step in when someone is out. It's an incredibly challenging job. We don't just learn the one track that a single rocket will do in the show. We learn the entire show. Sometimes do you only have like a moment's notice before you have to jump in? There have been times where it's mid-show and then all of a sudden we're on the stage. An 18-year rocket vet, she knows her parents could be in that audience. They pop up and they show up in the front row for a show where I'll, I'll hear my dad cheering and I'm like, oh my gosh, my parents are here. They didn't tell me they're here, but they're here, okay. So your parents don't always warn you that they're coming? Oh no, they don't always warn me. I can see my mom's glasses reflecting with the lights and it's just really special to know that there's love coming at me while I'm performing. Reminder, the Rockettes are not just in sync with each other, but with you too. Joe Fryer, NBC News, New York. Still ahead, we'll pay a visit to some of the most festive spots in the world. We're back after this.
We are back on The Boost with holiday movies on practically every single channel and seasonal songs playing everywhere you go. It seems that everybody's full of holiday spirit. Joe Fryer is back with more on how Christmas cheer is spreading all across the country. In Manhattan, you'll find a bar that's already decked the halls and ceiling. Why did you decide to come here? Because I love Christmas. Miracle on 9th is a holiday pop-up bar. The other 10 months of the year, it's known for tequila and mezcal, but today drinks are served in Christmas-themed mugs. Mariah Carey plays once an hour. It takes us four days to, you know, redecorate the entire bar, replace everything with the, the kitschiest Christmas things we can find. This year, Miracle and its counterparts, Sip and Santa, have opened nearly 200 pop-up bars nationwide. These like reservations came out in early October and I was already looking at them. Christmas trees are going up faster and Christmas tunes are hitting the charts earlier. Spending on non-gift items like clothing and decorations forecast to jump 25% this year. Being in Christmas time, like this is this is when we bond the most. It's as if we're yearning to live inside our favorite holiday flicks. Christmas is the greatest day in the whole wide world. Whether it's Elf, which is celebrating its 20th anniversary. Hard to believe that just two days ago, none of us even knew one another. Or newer fare offered on networks like Hallmark, Lifetime, Netflix, and more. Entertainment Weekly counted 116 new films this year. Hilton even has Hallmark Channel-inspired hotel suites. Cheers. For those who want to take the spirit and spirettes home, holiday cocktail classes are in full gear. Get up and smell it. At the cocktailery in Charlotte, customers want wintry recipes like apple spiced cozy cognac, capturing that just cold enough for a scarf or reuniting with your childhood crush in your hometown feeling. We are slammed with people coming in and looking for those um, holiday flavors, cranberry, pecan, all those, you know, warm and cozy flavors. And the holiday cheer isn't just limited to land. Sometimes, as you can see here, it spreads to the water. We set sail on the Coco and Carol's cruise put on by Classic Harbor Line. Those who hopped aboard say after a stressful news year, they need a little Christmas now. Everyone's in a good mood, everybody's happy. You're about to have time off of work. So whether you're seeking a ship or a sip, for many there's no such thing as too early or too much. At Christmas time, the stately homes of Britain come to life with opulent decorations. And that is certainly true at High Clare Castle, better known as the real life Downton Abbey. It's where the popular show and movies were filmed. NBC's Kelly Cobiea got a special tour behind the scenes at the British Castle. Christmas time, Britain's stately homes come to life with opulent decorations. And that's certainly true at High Clear Castle, better known as the real downtown or Downton Abbey, where the popular show and movies were actually filmed. NBC's Kelly Cobiea is there enjoying the festivities. Ooh, show us around, Kelly. Guys, good morning. Well, it takes nearly a year of planning to get this castle Christmas ready. And we were given an early invite to see all the trimmings with the Lord and Lady themselves. Highclere Castle, a festive treat at Christmas. What a tree. It's beautiful. Now this screams Christmas. And it's how tall? It's 25 foot, which means I think it's bigger even than Windsor Castle's Christmas tree. <laughs> it's all about the bragging rights. Lady Carnarvon told me putting up the 25 foot Christmas tree this year was an Instagram hit, a team effort needing at least 20 people. And with true love and in Christmas's past, the Highclere tree featured in memorable scenes from Downton Abbey. This year, there's a historical family theme. So the King theme Tut. is about ancient Egypt and Tutankhamun and the gold and the treasures. I visited Egypt last month, a hundred years after the discovery, and saw the treasures of Tutankhamun in the Cairo Museum. It was Lord Carnarvon's great-grandfather, the fifth Earl of Carnarvon, who discovered the tomb in Egypt along with Howard Carter. Well, when he first started out there, all he found in his first season of, of moving thousands of tons of earth was a mummified cat. Many of us would have quit at that stage, and far from that, he was so determined it actually spurred him on. The castle boasts 300 rooms, many, like the library, lavishly decorated for the Christmas holiday. How many trees are in the castle? There are 60 inside and outside. Six zero. Six zero. 
that's a big Christmas. The next one to, to your left is going. And in the dining room, the immaculate table is laid out with precision, ready for a feast. And with celebrations in mind, it's time for a holiday cocktail. Louis Coelho is Heichler Castle's head butler. He makes their signature gin and tonic. And we do a bit of rosemary. Rosemary actually does have a sort of a Christmassy flavor as well. It does, actually. It's quite warm thing. And orange. <laughs> oh, should I try? You can smell the orange and the rosemary. Keeping in the spirit, Downton style. Ready to ring in the new year. The castle is open to the public for most of December for afternoon teas and Christmas cocktails. And after a couple of weeks of private family time, they'll start planning all over again for next year. Stick around for another joyful story that's coming up after the break. on the boost right here with one final feel-good story. Check it out. Uh, this one's all about getting a little boost from your friend. So a school bus driver recorded this video saying this happens daily when a young student exits his bus. Ready, David? Look at me. Give me a thumbs up. All right. That's right. Go, David. What a cheering wow. squad wow. from the back well, of the bus. Fast. The bus driver, by the way, claims to be the fastest kid alive. He always runs. Uh, look at him go. Look Wait, at him go. Run home. We have going? a cheering squad waiting. Come on. He's like Running David home. Gump. Running home? Man. Yeah, fastest kid alive. Aw. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed today as much as we did as we count down to Christmas. We will see you right back here tomorrow on Today All Day. Welcome to today. Every day. We are adding to the star power in our studio. The biggest names, only on today. See, we're coming in this early, right? Everybody, it's today. Like I won the lottery. How do you feel at this age, this stage? Liberated. We're just getting started, folks. Ain't no stop with us now. The boys are back in town. The boys are back in town. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. This has been fantastic. Everything and everyone you're talking about, only on today. Hey guys, welcome to The Boost on a big day here at Rockefeller Center. Tonight is the annual lighting of our Christmas tree. But before its shining moment, check out the story behind the Norway Spruce's journey from upstate New York to right here on our plaza. Here's Joe Fryer. 
When Matt and Jackie McGinley moved into their Vestal, New York home in 2019, they paid little attention to the giant tree towering over their driveway. We had a whole punch list of things that needed to get repaired, things that we wanted to update or remodel, and frankly, the tree was just kind of in the background. But someone else did take notice, Rockefeller Center's head gardener, Eric Pazze. In pulls a car, a uh, guy gets out. My name is Eric, I'm the head gardener from Rockefeller Center. I'm here to look at your tree. <laughs> and I was like, no. <laughs> Do you like understand how crazy you sound right now? They couldn't have known Pazze is a Rockefeller Christmas tree legend, having personally discovered each tree for the last 30 years. I Googled him and realized, and I quickly texted Matt, this is legitimate. We thought they were dating a lot of other trees, that maybe ours would be considered. And then as the date got closer and closer, we realized that, in fact, we probably did have the Rockefeller Center tree. The McGinleys knew they wanted to be part of this special tradition. And donating the tree, they hope it brings joy during a busy and sometimes emotional season. This is not about us, but it's about being of service to other people, giving them that chance to go and make memories by the tree. And for those like us who've had loss, to go back to that space and remember the people that they love. The McGinleys will be remembering Matt's mother, who passed away four years ago. I think she would think it was the coolest thing. I keep having this feeling of like, who am I not telling about this? There's somebody that, that I should be, that I feel like I ought to tell and it's her, you know. Um, I was able to reach out to her best friend and that person will be with us on the day of the cutting. The McGinley's two kids will be at the tree cutting too. Zoe, age 12 and Charlie, age nine, admit the hardest part of the whole process was keeping their tree's star status hidden until the official reveal. <laughs> I'm really bad at secrets, but I've been able to keep this one. <laughs> the tree stands 80 feet tall. It will arrive in this very spot this weekend with a full police escort, and it will become a part of New York history with 50,000 LED lights making it shine bright as a symbol of the holiday season. Three, two, one! Yeah! The deeply rooted tradition of the Rockefeller tree goes all the way back to 1931, when a Christmas tree was put up by the construction workers building Rock Center. Today, more than 100 million people visit the plaza each year to see the world famous tree. McGinley's say they're proud that tree from their own yard is playing a special role. Matt's mom used to always emphasize joy, and so that idea of joy in that space is really exciting. Such a beauty, and we'll see you later tonight during the star-studded lighting on NBC and Peacock. Now, though, let's turn to another holiday adventure around New York City with our girl Donna Ferris, and she had all the hot spots to get into the spirit of the season. Christmas in New York is magical, from the world-famous Rockefeller Center tree to the dazzling windows and light show at Saks Fifth Avenue. There is no place like it. If you can finish this sentence, Christmas in New York City is... Magical. That's my word too! At Macy's Santa Land in Herald Square, you can have your very own Miracle on 34th Street. Santa! I'm so excited to meet you. I saw you at the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade and I thought I have to come visit you. Do you have a special Christmas wish, Donna? Well, I would love to see the Sugar Plum Fairies at the Nutcracker on stage. Oh, the wonderful, wonderful Nutcracker Ballet. Well, it looks like my wish to Santa came true. Throughout the month of December, ballerina Ashley Hodd takes the stage in George Balanchine's The Nutcracker. You even smell like a sugar plum fairy. <laughs> Seeing the Nutcracker at Lincoln Center during the holiday season is so iconic. Why do you think that is? You have a Christmas tree that grows up to 41 feet tall, snowflakes twirling around. You have angels gliding across the stage in the Sugar Plum Fairy's kingdom. I mean, it's just so many different treats for people of all ages. Mm. I could never do ballet when I was little. 
Is there one little twirl or dance move you can show me? Sure. Okay, I'm gonna give it my best shot. Just give it like a little shuffle, that's right. And then you go side to side. Not as magical, but it's a, it's a moment. <laughs> Next, I twirled over to Woolman Rink in Central Park. Come on, let's skate. And enjoyed the bright lights in a New York City pedicab. Jingle all the way. To keep the spirit going, I stopped by Frosty's Christmas Bar in Times Square. Just stepped into a Christmas fairyland. A holiday destination decked out in ribbon, tinsel, and cocktails from the North Pole. Tis the season. Holiday markets like Bank of America's Winter Village at Bryant Park are a festive way to spend the day. We plan to browse around the shops and see uh, what gifts we can pick up and probably get a hot drink and just enjoy the ambience. You can buy things that are so different. 170 vendors sell their unique gifts and I wandered into one of their shops. Coco Puzzles uses original illustrations to promote inclusivity and diversity. And it's inspired by your daughter. It is inspired by my daughter. Love it. In the spirit of the holidays, I'm going to give away my Christmas wish to others. I've got Nutcracker tickets and a bunch of $200 gift cards. Let's spread the love. You just got engaged. It's your birthday. Yes. And it's the holidays. It's yes. Awesome. But it's our first Christmas together as well, so we're kind of starting a tradition now. I'd like to make your Christmas that much more special. So I'm going to give you tickets to George Balanchine's The Nutcracker. Oh, wow. What do you think of that? Oh, yeah, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> are you guys excited about the holidays? Yeah. What are you most excited about? My birthday. Your birthday? <laughs> Guess what? I'm one of Santa's helpers. Yes, I'm sort of an elf, yeah. So I want to give you guys a $200 gift card. Yeah! What do you most look forward to for the holidays? Uh, I'm looking forward to going to my grandma's house and eating turkey legs. <laughs> that sounds pretty good. <laughs> Waking up in the morning and having um, pre opening presents with my family. Aww. Okay, now I have to tell you a little secret. I work with Santa. And Santa told me to give you guys a $200 gift <gasps> card. Coming up, tis the season for holiday movies. We'll introduce you to the woman behind some of your favorites. That's right after the break. the boost it's that time of year people enjoying all those holiday rom-coms and while many of the stories center around Christmas one woman decided it was time to show Hanukkah some love Chanel Jones has that story I grew up in an observant Jewish home we observed all the holidays we traveled to Israel I was immersed in my Jewish world and upbringing here at Jean Meltzer's home in Herndon Virginia it's beginning to look a lot like Hanukkah but ever since she was little, Jean has had one forbidden love. I am a nice Jewish girl who has always loved Christmas. How can you not love the beauty of Christmas? There's the lights, there's the music. 
It's about joy and family and chunky sweaters and hot chocolate. And so it's just a very magical time. It just fills me with joy. But amid all the Christmas cheer, Jean started to feel a little left out. As I got older, I would go to bookstores and I would always see that one table with Christmas romances on it. And every year I would go and look for a Hanukkah romance and there never was one. So I just decided to write it myself. It's called The Matzah Ball, about two childhood flames from Jewish summer camp reunited years later for a big Hanukkah event. She wanted to scoff aloud at his chiseled chin, the disturbingly sexy shape of his gorgeous and prominent nose. Instead, her heart only beat faster. Jacob Greenberg had morphed into a full-grown and totally kosher stud muffin. Writing romance is always a blast because you get to experience the love, the first tensions, the excitement. I knew I wanted to write a Jewish romance and I knew I wanted it to be a Hanukkah romance. For Jean, part of the fun was writing much of herself into the book's main character, a young Jewish author who's secretly obsessed with Christmas. She loved everything about Christmas, the music, the throw pillows, the decor. It brought her to this place of unapologetic joy where nothing bad ever happened and everyone found their happy ending. My family was more observant, so for observant Jewish families, you don't celebrate Christmas in any form. I would like try to sneak uh, little green construction paper Christmas trees and my mom would come and tear them down. Sorry, mom. And uh, um, I would tape up my socks to the windows, hoping that Santa would arrive. And sadly, Santa never came. Something else Jean shares with her protagonist, a life-changing battle with chronic illness. Rachel wanted to fall in love. She wanted to get married, find her person. But who would love her with CFS? I was diagnosed with ME-CFS, myalgic encephalomyelitis, chronic fatigue syndrome, at 18, 19 years old. And as the years have progressed, I have basically become homebound and disabled. 75% of people uh, cannot work full-time with my disease, and 25% are actually bedbound. And I had an incredible opportunity to write what we experience on a page for people who might have no experience with chronic illness. Since it came out, the book has won praise from everyone, including one very important fan. My mom cries every time I call her. She's so happy, and there is nothing like hearing your mom like spell, you know what I mean? So even though I have to talk about how she ripped down my green construction paper <laughs> made for Christmas tree, she's very proud. As for her own love story, Jean found it with her husband, Jeff. And with the matzo ball's success, she already has more books in the works to keep the menorah fire burning. I never thought this book was going to get published. The way it's been accepted has just been beyond my wildest dreams. It's a Hanukkah miracle. <laughs> Speaking of holiday movies, we're about to introduce you to a woman who writes them all year long. She is known as Christmas Karen, and for her, Christmas, it's a year-round endeavor. Joe Fryer's back with her story. We barely know each other. I've never been more certain of anything. For so many, those made-for-TV holiday movies are Christmas comfort food, with ideas cooked up by writers like Karen Shaler. I think right now with everything going on in the world and all the negativity, we need these Christmas movies and novels as an escape, something feel good, something we can watch with our families, and that's why people are gravitating toward them. In a span of just 18 months, Karen wrote three of those Christmas movies, oh yeah, and three Christmas novels, a prolific feat earning her the nickname Christmas Karen. It's 24-7, so I feel like I'm living in Christmas all the time. Having Christmas year-round. Is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? I sort of went down the Christmas rabbit hole a couple years ago, and I tell people I pop my head back up and look around and see what's happening in the world and go, okay, I'm, I'm going back down. I'm happier down here. And I do a little Christmas Karen walk. We caught up with Karen in New York in front of the Met Museum's Christmas tree, a soaring 20-foot blue spruce that perfectly reflects her spirit. For you, Christmas is in your blood, right? I just found out from my grandma that my great aunt was born on Christmas Day, and her siblings named her Mary, M-E-R-R-Y, middle name Christmas, and their last name was Day. And so she's in Ripley's Believe It or Not for being named Mary Christmas Day. Yeah, caught me doing a little research here. A former journalist, she put her reporting skills to work a few years ago before writing her first Christmas movie. I watched all the Hallmark movies and Lifetime movies. I sat there with a notepad. The first break is at 18 minutes. The first kiss is here. They have to have a near-miss kiss. Hey, no fraternizing with the enemy! 
You know, I, I really studied it. That research inspired her to write A Christmas Prince. Aren't you worried they're all talking about us? I'm saying you're out of my league. The pop romantic comedy set in the fictional land of Aldovia was streamed on Netflix in 2017, introducing younger folks to the genre. The different generations like, what is this cheesy, crazy, silly, ridiculous movie? You acknowledge they're a little bit cheesy, right? I say it's uplifting and heartfelt, but if somebody says, Karen, that movie's cheesy, I'm like, if that means uplifting and heartfelt, yeah. You call it whatever you want. Just watch it and read it. <laughs> Next came a lifetime film, Every Day is Christmas. You remember being that much in love? Like so many movies, it was inspired by a Christmas carol with Tony Braxton channeling Scrooge. I took away their Christmas bonuses because they didn't meet their goals. Then Hallmark tapped her to write her third movie, Christmas Camp, about an ad executive who's sent to a rural retreat for a holiday attitude adjustment. They even take her phone. It's called Disconnecting to Reconnect to Christmas. That prompted Karen to create a real-life camp featuring all kinds of Christmas-themed classes. Now more books and movies are on the horizon, like Toy Building Elves and Santa's Workshop, Christmas Karen Keeps on Going, a Yuletide assembly line. Your world is 12 months of Christmas yeah. a year, and you're good with that, right? It's an honor to do what I do. It's a big responsibility. But Christmas 24-7 works for me. I love it. And as long as I can keep bringing people joy, I'm not stopping. Coming up, we're sharing some of our favorite holiday traditions. Stay with us. here on the boost as we get ready for tonight's big tree lighting it is one of our favorite traditions and savannah al craig carson and i brought some of our other favorites to studio 1a even one of our own oh looky looky there she is our tree is always puny and so we do a really elaborate lighting one <gasps> wow get ready two one ah you gotta have white lights because it speaks to Christmas and it feels like peace. The kids make their own ornaments. That's done. Let's start with Haley. A little hope. You gotta have lots of tinsel. There's a technique. You take a lot of it and you just keep throwing it in blobs. It's gotta look like it's dripping with beautiful icicles. I need a little help. Carson! Can you help me out with some lights? Thanks, Hoda. Oh, no, no, not white lights. There you go. No, 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 no. Here's some lights for the tree. It's only colored lights. 
What kind of person would put white lights on a tree? I mean, I know it looks fancy. Christmas shouldn't be fancy and elegant. It should be festive and fun. Have yourself a merry little Christmas. Grab this book right here. It's always under the tree. It's called A Special Gift. And my father would read it and all of us would sit around him. Now that my dad's not here, I have carried on the legacy of reading this book on Christmas Eve. We like to hang a stocking with all of ours. That's camouflage, and we do it in honor of the troops who are overseas and couldn't get back home for Christmas. We'll put this one front and center as a reminder. Ornaments, Craig, you can start with these. All right, well, thanks, Carson, but we actually use a pickle ornament. We also started hiding the pickle in the tree, and one of the kids will find the pickle, they get a surprise, and then we hide the pickle again baby Jesus there. Happy birthday to you. When we were dating, this is our first Christmas together. Dinner's over, out comes the birthday cake, and these people begin singing happy birthday to Jesus. I was in, and ever since, we've been singing happy birthday to Jesus. Happy birthday, baby Jesus. Happy birthday to you. Savannah, I believe this is for you. Thanks, Craig. I always like to put something a little sweet on the tree. We used to love having candy canes on the tree, and by the time Christmas rolled around, all the candy canes were gone. Put it up high so the kids don't get all of them. I love Christmas tree ornaments that have a sense of humor and have some personality. A Christmas cactus, because I'm from Arizona. I like ornaments that are kind of weird, honestly. Here's a New York City taxi cab and a little pretzel. The weirder the better. And look at this fancy little flamingo right up front. One thing I started doing was making a photo ornament of the kids every year. And I love opening the ornament box and seeing how they've grown in a year. Here's our family. Oh, oh there's our family, our Today Show family. Tree looks good. Al, you gotta finish it off. Ooh, wow. I can never get it untangled. Our tree topper is a beautiful black angel. Almost there. You don't feel it's Christmas until she's on top of the tree. Yay! We got some ornaments that represent these beautiful black angels. I'm going to put the angel right next to the baby Jesus. We've done the ugly Christmas sweater. We've done the ugly Christmas suits. Even if you don't want to wear an ugly Christmas sweater, you can always put one on your tree. Bad taste is always timeless. Really looks lovely, but something's missing. Oh, there's, there's no pine scent. The scent, you know, especially when you cut it down and you've got the, the pine sap on your hands. Nick and I have been going out cutting a tree since he's been about six or seven. We're kind of lumberjacks and we go out and we put on flannel shirts. Got our tree, right? Yeah, we did. I stole these out of a New York City cab. That says Merry Christmas. <laughs> we all have our favorite songs around Christmas time. You might even have yours playing right now in the background. But did you know how Christmas carols came to be? NBC's Kelly Cobiea is giving us a look at their origin and some of our favorite sounds of the season. In a small medieval city in Cornwall, Southwest England, at the historic Truro Cathedral, the sound of Christmas. The legendary cathedral choir singing the story of the birth of Christ. That famous service familiar to so many started here in tiny Truro more than a hundred years ago when carols weren't sung in church. They were singing them in just out in their, their own homes, in pubs, in the streets. They just, you know, they, they was a, a culture that had uh, gone very much out of the churches and, and into, the, into the wild. A local bishop hoping to lure very merry revelers away from pubs and ale and back to church replaced sacred music with the people's songs, carols, and the crowds followed. Nine lessons in carols. Many of the songs we know as Christmas carols have pagan roots, tunes to teach and share for those who couldn't read or write. Lots of carols began as songs to teach a story to a child. So lots of them are very simple, memorable tunes. Children and musically challenged correspondents. Now the holly bears a berry that's 
as white as the milk. As white, uh, I don't remember the tune no, part. Fine, I'll be with you. I'll be with you. This is the carol in its full glory. This carol, Sans Day, originated in Cornwall, and like so many Christmas carols, spread far and wide beyond England's shores, passed on by sailors and travelers. Some carols change along the way. This is how O Little Town of Bethlehem sounds in Britain, but we sing it like this. Same words, but completely different melody. In Truro, the choir boys and girls spend their early mornings and late afternoons learning dozens of carols to be perfectly tuned for the Christmas crowds. Are you nervous? A little bit, yeah. <laughs> They've rehearsed to be ready for the big day. It's the music we've heard countless times, yet every year, come back for more. We know them. We know them so uh, well. They're part of our DNA. Songs that say it's Christmas. For Sunday Today, Kelly Cobiella, True Rope, England. Coming up, we got the latest viral video. It'll boost your day. That's right after this. We've got time for one more story, and this one, it'll leave you with a smile. Take a look. More proof this morning that a little kindness can go a long, long way. A woman was flying with her service dog named Munchie <laughs> when the woman next to them noticed the dog seemed uncomfortable. So guess what? She gave up her pillow, gave it to Munchie. Aww. Munchie's cozy. She even put her arm around him as if it were her own dog. Munchie's owner called the woman her angel. That's it for today. We hope we were able to start your day off with a boost of holiday cheer, and we'll end it with more during our annual tree lighting, Christmas in Rockefeller Center. We'll see you then. And we're back tomorrow with more of the boost right here on Today All Day. Welcome to today. Every day. We are adding to the star power in our studio. The biggest names, only on today. See, we're coming in this early, right? Everybody, it's today. Like I won the lottery. How do you feel at this age, this stage, liberated? We're just getting started, folks. Ain't no stop with us now. The boys are back in town. The boys are back in town. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. This has been fantastic. Everything and everyone you're talking about, only on today. 
Welcome back to Pop Start Plus. As the year winds down, we're going to look back at some of the biggest and buzziest moments of 2023. From music to TV and movies, we're hitting the rewind button and taking a trip down memory lane. Let's dig into our Pop Start Plus year rewind. First things first, 2023 was a huge year for music. We saw several record-breaking tours and music streams hit one trillion at the fastest pace ever. So it's not too surprising that the 2023 Time Person of the Year was a musician. Each year, Time Magazine features the person or group who they believe had the most influence on the world. So let's have a drum roll for this year's pick. Who beat out King Charles III and Hollywood Strikers? Why, it was Taylor Swift, of course. Time Magazine Editor-in-Chief Sam Jacobs stopped by Studio 1A to reveal this year's pick and share their exclusive Exclusive interview with the pop star. The 2023 Time Person of the Year. Dating all the way back to 1927, Time has selected the man, woman, group, or concept with the most influence on the world, for better or worse, during the past 12 months. Sam Jacobs is Time's editor in chief. Sam, good morning. Welcome to today. You get a drum roll. Oh, okay. Wait. Okay. <laughs> we need one, but you, you can reveal right now yeah. who it is. Are you ready for it? We're, We're ready. ready for okay. it. The 2023 Time Person of the Year is Taylor Swift. Okay, okay. Taylor Swift, and I think you have several covers. Yes, you do, Run and an with interview it. with Taylor. Mm -hmm. Let me just let's just get this out of the way, Sam, because the world is on fire right now, and mm -hmm. you know this is Person of the Year, and it purports to say this is the most influential mm -hmm. person or group of persons in the world this year. You pick Taylor, we know about her influence. How did you justify this decision? Every year, you know, we get the staff together. We debate this throughout the entire summer and fall. Picking one person who represents the 8 billion people on the planet is no easy task. And certainly in a, in a year when the world is divided, there's a lot of light and a lot of darkness. There are a number of different choices that could have represented 2023. But we picked a choice, someone who represents joy someone who's bringing light to the world, someone who's taken her own story and made it big enough for everyone. Mm -hmm. And I don't think there's anyone who's moved so many people so well as Taylor Swift did in 2023. You actually, your, your magazine sat down and spoke with her. Uh, did she reveal anything new or what was it like for her to learn about this? You know, the amazing thing about Taylor Swift is, she, at least in 2023, she was like the weather. She was everywhere. <laughs> you could have a conversation with anyone about her but we haven't heard much from her. It's actually been nearly four years since Taylor Swift has sat down and had a conversation with a journalist. We sat down and talked to her this fall, and she was very open about what this experience was like, what it feels like to be the center of attention for the entire world. Of course, her personal life is something that's fascinating to people. But we also learned how hard it was to prepare and pull off this tour. I mean, gathering together 70,000 people night after night after night requires a huge amount of dedication and preparation. Well, I mean, she has not done an interview in four mm -hmm. years with any journalist. She doesn't need to. She mm -hmm. doesn't need the press. So it's so interesting that she really did sit down. And she it seems like from the interview, she was very open mm -hmm. about a number of things, including her own career trajectory and talking about a time of darkness when mm -hmm. she felt she was canceled, left by the side of the road, and how she clawed her way back. What's amazing is how she's taken those negative points, which she sees as those low points in her career, the acquisition of her music by someone who she never wanted to buy her music, the some of the attention that she received in the public spotlight. She reacted to that in the past, and it was really difficult for her. She went away. She talks about in this interview being scared to get on the phone, being scared to leave her house. And what we've seen in this year is someone who's finally comfortable in her skin. I mean, it's amazing. This is only the fourth person of the year, solo person of the year, mm -hmm. who was born in the last 50 years. Mm. She's 33 years old, yet she's a 17-year veteran of this industry. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing someone who really just feels very comfortable with where she is in her life. And talking about her personal life, because her last relationship she never spoke about. People were always questioning, is she in one? This one is so out in front, and she was talking about Travis Kelsey in your interview as well. Well, well we asked her that question. Yeah. What does it feel like to be yeah. so public with your romantic life? And she, she laughs. She says, we're just two people supporting each other, doing what we love. Mm -hmm. and, and she feels like that's the right place for her to be at this moment. And in fact, the idea of hiding away that relationship doesn't feel comfortable to her. Swifties are going to eat up every... 
Well, who wanted the cat? Part of this. Did she want the cat, or did you guys in the in one of the covers? Uh, I think it's hard to resist this cat. Uh, America. Karma is a cat, Karma as you may well be aware. This cat is Benjamin Button, uh, <laughs> yeah. Taylor's cat, who yeah. joined us for this photo shoot. And uh, I think makes a remarkable cover. Yeah. Well, she talks okay. about Travis. She talks yeah. about uh, what it takes to get ready for the Eras tour, which yeah. I was amazed yeah. at. So right. uh, it's a really interesting interview. Fascinating read, Sam. Thank you, Sam. Thank you Appreciate very it. much. Unsurprisingly, Taylor Swift is also Spotify's top global artist of 2023. Since January 1st, listeners have streamed her music more than 26.1 billion times. Taylor's Eras tour also became the first tour to earn more than one billion dollars with 4.35 million tickets sold. If that were not enough, her Eras Tour movie also brought in quite the sales on its opening weekend. Today, correspondent Emily Aketa hit the film's premiere and caught up with a few excited Swifties. Welcome to the Eras Tour. It's the movie premiere of Swifties Wildest Dreams. We're ready for it. Taylor Swift's long-awaited Eras Tour concert film debuting in style at the Grove in LA. And we scored a golden ticket along with more than 2,000 others who got to walk red carpets like this before heading inside to see the concert film. And if one superstar wasn't enough, the queen bee herself, Beyonce, turned out to support Swift on the red carpet. And Swift paying tribute to her fellow superstar in an Instagram post. Have you ever been more excited to see a movie? Never no. before. <laughs> this is the best day of my life. Taylor, how are you feeling? The superstar arriving in a blue Oscar de la Renta gown mingled with fans on the red carpet. Attendees got lots of Eras themed snacks. Look at these, they're amazing! Before being divided up into 13 separate theaters, Swift's favorite number. Oh. With Swift greeting each group personally. That you absolutely are main characters in this film because that's what made the tour magical. Then it was showtime. We are literally watching the concert film with Taylor Swift right behind us. The night unlike any other movie experience, with guests encouraged to dance and sing, so I was happy to oblige. And so was Taylor, who spent the night bopping to her own songs. The two hour, 45 minute concert movie, officially debuting today, already shattering records. Advanced ticket sales raking in more than $100 million globally. That's more than triple what Barbie, the biggest movie of the year, brought in ahead of its opening weekend. It's about being there with her, but also about the memories that you're reliving as you listen to all of these songs. What's sure to be a blockbuster concert film coming amid her sold out tour. But for those who couldn't get tickets to see her in person, this movie is a true love story. When we return, we're digging into even more of your favorite artists and tunes from 2023. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to our Pop Start Plus 2023 Rewind. I'm super excited to get into the music we just couldn't stop listening to this year. As always, Spotify has released its list of the most streamed songs. Let's count down the top five spots, shall we? Number five is Ella by La Sola by Eslabon Armado and Peso Pluma. It became the first regional Mexican song to reach the top 10 on Billboard's Hot 100 chart. What a feat. From the lyrics to the instrumentals, the song is said to capture the essence of both Mexican and Mexican-American cultures. Originally written in a bedroom, the hit has definitely come a long way. It's pretty cool to see a song from another international artist take the number four spot. South Korean singer Jung Cook of the group BTS teamed up with rapper Lato on the song Seven. Seven is Jung Cook's first solo single, and in an interview with Variety, he said he wanted to show a more mature version of himself. Believe it or not, it became the fastest song to reach one billion streams on Spotify. Congrats to Jung Cook. Coming in at number three is our buddy Harry Styles. We had the pleasure of hearing him perform his hit as it was live on the Today Show Plaza. Now, many fans noted the track was noticeably different from Harry's usual rock sound. In an interview with Sirius XM, Harry shared the song was inspired by changes in his life and explained his decision to pair a cheerful beat with lyrics that were a little more serious. It was a choice that was obviously well received by his fans who just couldn't get enough of the song. Taking the number two spot is Kill Bill by SZA. The song, of course, takes inspiration from the Kill Bill films with lyrics that discuss SZA's plan to get revenge on an ex. When Kill Bill became her first track to hit the top spot on Billboard's Hot 100 list, the singer says it was such a shock that it took her over a week to process. Well-deserved SZA. Now to the top song of 2023, Miley Cyrus's Flowers. It now has more than 1.6 billion streams globally. Like SZA's hit, Flowers is about an ex, but Miley focused on moving on and being independent. She said that she changed the lyrics from what was originally a sad love song to the empowering tune it became. Good for her. Spotify also releases a list of top global albums, and one standout album was from Latin artist Carol G. It has been a huge year for the Latin music industry, with the genre breaking records and hitting $627 million in revenue. When superstar Carol G joined us for our city concert series, she had one of the biggest crowds the plaza has ever seen. We got to chat with her about her journey ahead of that concert. Carol G, good morning good again. Morning. Good morning. Hey. I mean, <laughs> obviously, it's an understatement to say there was a huge crowd outside. I mean, like the biggest crowd we've ever had, and they're all here for you. But this, this was, you're not an overnight success. I mean, you've been working at this for a long time. For a long time, like uh, since 2006, I think it was my first time, like my parents signed my mm -hmm. first contract. And wow. until this, I like, I really love everything. I love all the process because I think you have to fail mm -hmm. in love with the process. Mm -hmm. When you're in this point, that's what it's going to make you mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. even Appreciate getting surprises it. every yeah. day. And I'm yeah. super shocked about what is happening outside. Like the energy is so special. I have to say like we're having a great time, right? Mm -hmm. Like even when we're shooting something and we go to commercials, we're, we're still having fun. Yeah, yeah. we're yeah. still having yeah. fun. So I am really grateful and I had to thank all of you that are supporting me the way you are doing it. I'm super happy. I can't mm, like I can't wait to celebrate with my team. <laughs> 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 your, your enthusiasm and excitement is so infectious and it seems you've posted these Instagram photos these throwbacks of you uh, growing up and it seems like your love of music <laughs> and, and this joy is in there have you always have you always been a musical force you always like? when like my father he always wanted to be a singer and he didn't have like the opportunity so when he realized that I like music so he put me like I studied everything music instruments like different things and he was my first manager even wow. we are like we are two people in our team my father and, and I and after 10 years we just started like having these different meetings about people being interested in what we were doing. Mm -hmm. And it is so special for me right now to celebrate that my family were with me all the time because I think my 
the, the, my confidence came because they support Absolutely. me, they believed in me. So yeah, it's an invitation I for your that. parents, <laughs> yes, yes. to support your kids, please. Here's, here's what I love about your story as well. It's like you said, this didn't happen overnight. Uh, before you landed this record deal, so you auditioned for, I think it was uh, the Colombian version of X Factor, didn't really work. And there was a moment where you were like, I don't know if this is gonna work. And then look at this. It's such a testimony. And you know what? what? Like, I, I realized that my music was my thing after I left it really? here in New York. Really? Like really? between New York and Boston, I was just like studying different things. You were gonna was, give up or walk away from it? Yeah, I did. In the 2012, I was like, okay, I'm like done. I'm done. Mm -hmm. This industry is so hard, yeah, and yeah. and it's like it takes a lot of. You, yes, your yes. soul and everything. So I just stopped doing it. Like my father was super upset with me. We stopped like talking <laughs> oh like for more gosh. than three months. And and then I was here just taking my subway because I, I studied English here in, in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. And there was like a big billboard about music conference in Boston. No and way. I was like every day like, oh my God, no. <laughs> not again, please, not again. And I went and it was like another, I studied music in Colombia at the university, but here, it was like more about the business. Mm. So I realized that I can, this, like what I love and what I feel passionate to do, it, it could be my business too. Mm -hmm. So I went back to Colombia and until this the rest day. Is the rest is history. And, and it's amazing. what about, I, we talked about earlier in the show, the new Barbie movie that's coming out soon. <laughs> Your song featured in the Barbie movie. I mean, now you're, you're just a part of like pop culture. <laughs> And that's like for me. That's the crazy thing. Like first, when you try to try to just uh, get in love with your Latina community, but for me right now, like being here, <laughs> like being in this place is more than just a language. It's just going like okay. more than that. Different culture, different countries. It, that's for me mm -hmm. something that I, I'm not still like. You know, getting it. And you've even got the pink going for Barbie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have my hair like it's funny. You know what you have done? You, you know, you had the Spanish language album. You've had the big, we've had some big names here yep. at the Today Show, the biggest names, yep. right? And you have had the largest crowd. That says so <laughs> much. And I love that you're allowing yourself to receive it. Yeah. So yeah. congratulations. Thank you. After the break, we're talking podcasts. Stay with me. Welcome back. True crime podcasts consistently rank as some of the most popular podcasts ever. There's something about a good old whodunit story that really draws people in. Dateline's Keith Morrison recently introduced his new podcast, Murder in Apartment 12, and it made Apple's list of most popular podcasts of 2023. Keith stopped by 1A to tell us all about it. 
This morning, we have a first look at a gripping new Dateline podcast called Murder in Apartment 12. It's a case filled with twists and turns, and it all began with a shocking crime in a small Arkansas town, the death of a beauty queen. We're going to talk with Dateline correspondent Keith Morrison in just a moment, but first, take a look at this preview. It was the kind of story that makes headlines, the kind you've probably heard before. Local beauty queen found murdered in her apartment. 911, where's the emergency? The young woman's boyfriend found the body and called police. No, no, son, please, he's dead. Investigators examined the alibis of the usual suspects, and you guessed it, they came to believe the boyfriend did it. Kevin, there's no doubt in my mind that you killed her. It's a story so familiar, it's like singing an old camp song. Everybody knows the tune and the words. Except, in this case, somebody changed the beat, threw in some new words. When I started following the story of Nona Dirksmeyer's murder 18 years ago, the police were convinced that her boyfriend, Kevin Jones, had killed Nona in a jealous rage. A lot of people in Russellville, Arkansas, the town where Nona lived, thought so too. After all, he was covered in her blood when police arrived at Nona's apartment that night. But here's the thing. When Kevin Jones, a college sophomore, was put on trial, a jury acquitted him. Everybody has an opinion, but that doesn't convict in our courts. Not enough evidence, the jurors told me. And in fact, forensic evidence gathered at the scene actually excluded Kevin. So, who killed Nona Dirksmeyer? This case probably had more statewide publicity than any criminal case in many, many years, perhaps ever, in Arkansas. Wow. Keith, great to have you. I and as know. usual, you've, to be here. Good you've to be hooked here. us in. I know. <laughs> Tell it, who did as, which, the idea, which is know. the point. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is almost 20 years ago. You talk about covering this. and I know. Uh, yeah. But when you get a chance to go back and, and look at something like this, are you surprised by some of the twists and turns that, that have happened in, in, in the, that I period of time? Frequently, they don't go away. Mm. These things just keep on getting more and more mysterious in, in their own way. Um, and, and you can never tell exactly what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, it, especially when you think you know what's going to happen, you don't. Um, and hmm. there's some new chapter to be added every time. So but, without giving anything away, what uh, are examples of some new details? Well, um, <laughs> do I really want to tell you that? Yes, oh, we do. Well, <laughs> it's, it's just more, a little something. It's more yeah, friendly. Just a, little, a little bit. Just a little. A little. Bit. Uh, well... I think it's fair to, to suggest that there was another potential uh, suspect in the mm -hmm. case, and uh, more things have been found out about that man and mm -hmm. where he was when this happened and why it may have occurred. Hmm. Or maybe it was a boyfriend. You'll just have to see. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. You know, this show marks your eighth original Dateline podcast. What do you think it is about true crime and for people listening to it as opposed to, I mean, we, you know, obviously we have video. We like to see voice. it. But yeah, your voice is for sure. Yeah. But what is it? People are captivated by these podcasts. I, yeah, I don't know. Do you think I they mean, just want to solve it? I, I, it a... But maybe it's that. Maybe yeah. it's just a, it's a story. You know, it's, a, it's like any other story. But sure. it's just a it's a story where you don't know what the ending is going to be, and so mm -hmm. you follow it along. And um, they are, from my point of view, absolutely wonderful to do because you can live in the detail, mm -hmm. and live in the moments, and live in the feeling, and live in the sort of weirdness of the way people think about things mm -hmm. for, uh, you know, a longer time. 2023 was also a big year for book lovers. Colleen Hoover is a force in the literary world. She has sold more than 20 million copies of her books and fans flock to see her at book festivals all around the country. Earlier this year, Jenna Bush Hager sat down with Hoover for a conversation about her huge success. I write because I have to. I think it's my therapy. It feeds my soul. I think I would be writing whether anyone read what I wrote or not. Author Colleen Hoover says she didn't set out for fame, but her love of writing helped fame find her. Hoover dominates the New York Times bestsellers list, once claiming eight of the top 10 paperback spots simultaneously. She sold more than 16 million books last year alone even outselling the Bible. 
are legions of fans so dedicated, so passionate, they call themselves cohorts. I have read almost every single book written by Colleen Hoover. It's currently 1.11 in the morning. I just finished Hopeless. Take me back to your childhood. When did you know you wanted to write? Um, since I can remember. My sister, who was about three years older than me, learned how to read and write before I could. And I was so jealous because I'm like, oh my gosh, you know how to do that. I want to know how to do that because I just had all these stories I wanted to tell. And um, I was just super excited to learn the alphabet. <laughs> I was very disappointed that I didn't get to write my first story the first day of kindergarten. <laughs> Years later, when she attended Texas A&M University Commerce, she was already married with children. She put her dreams of writing aside to study social work, a more practical career to help support her three sons. We were very poor. We lived in a single wide trailer house. We didn't have a front doorknob, but we lived a great life. We just struggled a little bit financially. Colleen never let go of her passion and began writing again just for fun. But then at Christmas in 2012, a beautiful accident changed everything. We had bought my grandmother a Kindle for Christmas. I was researching how to get a document onto a Kindle and came across Amazon's self-publishing platform. And I was like, oh, I could just load it up here and then she can download it. Four months later, Slammed, the story she planned to share just with her family, landed her on the New York Times bestsellers list. Were you surprised? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Astonished. <laughs> now with 25 titles to her name, including Verity and Ugly Love, Hoover's romances and psychological thrillers are emotionally gripping. Her most popular novel, It Ends With Us, centers on domestic violence and is loosely based on her mother's life. My mother and father divorced when I was two, and one of my earliest memories was him throwing a TV at her. Mm -hmm. She was able to get out of that relationship. And then from then on, I just remember growing up with a mother who was so strong and independent. It's a book that people really care about. Yeah. I think people that maybe have been in hard situations feel seen. It's been very heartwarming to read how my mother's story has actually given strength to other women to be able to leave that, their situations. The story is now being adapted into a movie starring Blake Lively. The cohorts yeah. are having a lot of opinions <laughs> about what movie. Blake Lively's wearing. <laughs> right. Did right. that surprise you? It does. It really does. When I wrote the book, it wasn't about the age of the characters. It wasn't about what they were wearing. It was about the message that I wanted to get across. And I think the people that are doing the movie are doing such a phenomenal job. Shining a light on domestic violence is one way Hoover uses her fame for good. She also hosts her annual Book Bonanza charity event in her home state of Texas. Book Bonanza is wild. It's so wild. <laughs> How can you explain it to somebody that's never been here before? Uh, Comic-Con, Disney World. <laughs> the lines were insane this morning. Thousands of readers from all over the country come to meet more than 200 authors at the sold-out event. Hoover started the nonprofit back in 2018. It has since raised more than $1 million for different charities. That little girl who was mad she didn't learn the whole alphabet on day one of kindergarten, if you could say one thing to her about what life is like now, what would you say? You are gonna be so happy. <laughs> so happy. Are you ready to dig into the TV shows and movies that stole the show this year? We'll be right back with more of our Pop Star Plus 2023 Rewind.
Welcome back to our Pop Start Plus 2023 Rewind. We're taking a look back at some of the biggest pop culture moments of 2023. It was a huge year for TV and movies in many ways, but especially because we saw Hollywood writers and actors go on strike for the first time in 15 years. After disagreements surrounding pay, contracts, and protections, the strikes lasted 148 days and 118 days, respectively, before both unions reached deals. In that time, we saw production of film and TV shows come to a halt. Nevertheless, there were some great releases this year, and I can't wait to dig into all of them with you. Let's get to it. The highest grossing movie of 2023 in one of the American Film Institute's picks for top motion pictures was Barbie. Fans donned and pink flocked to see Greta Gerwig's fun take on the lives of the beloved Barbie and Ken dolls. The film received tons of positive reviews, and I'm sure its amazing cast and great soundtrack didn't hurt either. The second highest grossing film was actually a family pick, the Super Mario Brothers movie from our parent company, NBC Universal. The iconic Mario and Luigi were voiced by Chris Pratt and Charlie Day. They absolutely nailed those character voices. It was a blast seeing the video game come to life on the big screen. Back in March, Chris Pratt stopped by and dished on what it was like joining the cast. So let's go. Ah, that iconic song could only mean one thing, folks. We are talking. Super Mario with superstar Chris Pratt. Oh. That music just gives me chills, I know. right? Uh, he has really done it all, playing the lovable Andy Dwyer in the hit NBC comedy Parks and Rec, then starring in blockbuster franchises as Star Lord and Guardians of the Galaxy, and dinosaur whisperer Owen Grady in the Jurassic World movies. Well, now Chris is saying, It's a me, Mario, in the Super Mario Brothers movie. Take a look. Let's pop in this pipe and we're on our way. Oh. It's the only way to fly, man. Oh, wow. Love these pipes. Oh. That's how it works. Yeah. <laughs> I never knew. That's right. Chris, it is so good to see you. Thanks for being here. Oh, man, it's my pleasure. I'm so, so happy to be here. So how do, how do you get ready to play, I mean, this this iconic character? I mean, not just, I mean, it's global. Uh, yeah. So you're you're taking on this, this role. What was it that got you into the mindset to come up with that voice? 30 years of playing the Super Mario Brothers. It's, I've been, I've been in deep training yes. since I was nine years old yes. to play this role. So it's re it really, you know, um, that's it. Just knowing the games, mm -hmm. loving the games, talking to the directors and the, and the writer on, on who this character is and, you know, moving this out of the video game world into the narrative film world. Uh, you know, we get to learn a lot more about these characters mm -hmm. and kind of ground them in reality and come up with a voice. Where do you practice your voice? Where do I practice it? In the car, in the car on the way to, to, this, to the stage. What they do is, you know, it, it was about maybe two sessions a month for over the course of a couple of years to do wow. this uh, movie. And we tried a lot of different stuff. To, and you throw a lot of stuff at the wall to see what sticks. And ultimately what happens is you get to the, um, the studio to do a recording session and they say, this is the stuff we picked out of all of our previous sessions. This is where we're zeroing in on the voice. This is what we like. And they would play this reference track at the beginning of my own voice that I'd hear back and they'd say, aim for that. And so that's sort of how we zeroed in on the voice. They, they really uh, picked, uh, for, of the multitude of options I had given them, they picked the voice. Oh, wow. So we got to show our kids this film. Yeah. And they have a little review. Okay. If we can oh. show you. All right. All right. Let's take a look. Pop in this pipe and we're on our way. Oh. It's the only way to fly, man. I loved it so much. I liked it all, but my favorite part mm. was when. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Oh, oh, that's fantastic. Mr. Brad? Yeah. How did you do it and were you nervous? Oh. Well, I, I wanted, how did you do, it, did you do you, it? And were you nervous? Oh, th well, thank you for, <laughs> for that glowing review. Yeah. Uh, and the spoiler alert. Yeah, yeah. and the spoiler alert. Um, I, I was a little nervous. I knew that p kids such as yourself and even kids at heart such as myself, we've been playing this game for a very long time and we care deeply about these characters, so I, I didn't want to mess it up. So I was a little nervous. And how did I do it? I just tried my hardest every, every session for over the course of a couple of years and, and showed up to work and did my best, and that's how I did it. You know, Life lesson right there. Yeah, oh, yeah. You know, I, I wondered when you showed your kids the movie, I see yeah. you, what was their reaction? Oh, my son Jack's 10, so he's mm -hmm. similar uh, to, to Adele. 
He's nine, right? Yep, yeah. exactly. So Jack's 10, he loved it, man. He loved it. He brought a group of his friends, and, you know, he loves to play Smash Brothers. He loves the Mario Brothers, and it was cool because he – it, almost immediately, he forgot that I was voicing the character. Oh, so that's good. He just got caught up in the movie, and mm -hmm. so that's a, that is a good sign. Wow! In fact, uh, my my son Nick and I—he was a little younger, but this is how we did our homage to uh, the Mario <laughs> Brothers. <laughs> that's, that's, oh, that's so this, good. This wasn't Halloween. We just dress up. Like <laughs> that's that's it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it was a weekend. It's like a random yeah. Tuesday. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so much fun. Now, who could forget the fun rivalry that grew out of Barbie and Oppenheimer being released on the same day? The films could not be more different but both were huge box office hits. Oppenheimer told the life of J. Robert Oppenheimer, the scientist behind the development of the atomic bomb. Savannah Guthrie sat down with director Christopher Nolan to discuss the film and his take on it premiering amid the actor's strike. Oppenheimer from acclaimed writer-director Christopher Nolan. It takes us inside the mind of J. Robert Oppenheimer, the father of the atomic bomb, with an intimate look at that first test where they weren't sure if they were about to destroy the world. Take a look. Oh, did you think we were going to show you? We're holding our breath for this movie. Christopher Nolan, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, I want to talk about the movie. It's incredible. I had the opportunity to see it. You're here because the actors are on strike. <laughs> the writers are on strike. Yeah. And they had to, just in the middle of your Oppenheimer premiere in London, they walked out. What was that moment like to be ready to show your movie to the world and then this happens? It was, it was a bittersweet moment. I mean, we were all there. We were very fortunate. We had the opportunity to somewhat, you know, celebrate the film. The actors were all there to support. Uh, but then when the time came, they had to down tools and, and go off in support of all of their fellow actors and in support of the writers as well. It's, it's an important moment in the industry. Uh, the business models have been rewritten by the companies we work for, and it's time to rewrite the deals. And uh, hopefully... Um, with everybody unified, that can happen as quickly as possible. I should mention Comcast, our parent company, is a member of the Producers Alliance. Oppenheimer is a phenomenal movie. I was just saying to you, I don't know that you could have picked a more difficult subject than quantum physics and splitting atoms and the character of J. Robert Oppenheimer. Yeah. What, what drew you to this? Well, I, you know, for me, Oppenheimer's story is the most dramatic story I've ever encountered. It's as simple as that. When I learned the fact that leading up to that Trinity test that we just saw the, the moment before, um, he and his fellow scientists couldn't completely eliminate the possibility that in triggering that, they might destroy the entire world. But they went ahead and they pushed that button anyway. And that, for me, that's the most dramatic situation I've ever heard of. It, it, it raises so many questions, moral questions. I mean, to yeah. say nothing of how you visualize the actual, um, the, the, the bomb, the detonating of the bomb, mm. which, by the way, people should know, if you're going to go see it, this isn't CGI. <laughs> you were very intent on making sure this was as uh, raw an experience as it could be for the audience. Yeah, I think raw is a good word. We wanted imagery that has beauty but threat to it. Computer mm. graphics tend to be, they can feel a bit anodyne, a bit safe. Um, that's why they're tough to use in horror movies, for example. Uh, but finding, challenging my team to use real methods, some of them microscopic and tiny, some of them absolutely vast, uh, that, I think, gives the imagery the bite that it needs. It's interesting because you I know you're you to be a sort of an analog person. You don't you famously <laughs> don't have a smartphone. Is that right? Uh, I do not. I mean, which is just astonishing, but and <laughs> congratulations. Well, thank you. Um, but I also read that you even with the scripts that you mm. that you wrote that you wanted to come and bring the script to your actors personally yeah. and that in the case of Cillian Murphy who plays Robert Oppenheimer you brought it to him in Ireland. And I did, yeah. Did you wait while he read it, or did you give him a moment of privacy? I, I, <laughs> no pressure. I, he came to visit me in my hotel in Dublin, and I handed him the script, and I went off to... Uh, to look at the, the wonderful uh, Hugh Lane Gallery. They have Francis Bacon <laughs> Studio there, which I'd never got the chance to see. Spent a few hours there, came back and he'd finished it, and he looked uh, a little shocked. 
And he said yes right away? He said, I think he'd already said yes before I had oh. him read the script, but he had that sort of relief, a slightly shocked, you know, because I think he was already committed in his own mind, but uh, he seemed to respond very well to the script. But he looked a little challenged. He looked a little afraid in the right way, because you want to you challenge the actors you work with. We're not done yet. We're revisiting conversations with the cast of some of your favorite shows after the break. Welcome back to our Pop Start Plus 2023 Rewind. We're talking about all the films and shows you just couldn't get enough of. The Fast and Furious franchise from NBC's parent company, NBC Universal, debuted in theaters more than 20 years ago. Sadly, it's coming to an end. Earlier this year, it was revealed the series would conclude with a two-part finale. There was lots of anticipation around Fast 10 this year, the beginning of the end. Ahead of its release, John Cena popped by, even hosted Popstar Plus to give us the scoop on the film. Take a look at what he had to say. When you get to the advanced stage, all you do is add weight, oh. like Al Roker. <laughs> So it means something like this. <laughs> it's very easy, and you don't have to get to a gym. <laughs> Cena, that was John Cena back in 2017, showing off his iconic WWE moves. And in addition to being a 16-time world champion, John is also an actor, a children's book author, even a platinum certified rapper. And he's back on the big screen in Fast 10, the latest installment of the Fast and the Furious franchise. Take a look. Ready? Ready. Oh, no, you're good. You're good. Okay, uh, song lyrics, stub toes, and tan and cars. <laughs> From Cena. squatting Al Roker on the Today Show to cool road trips with Canon cars. You know what? Okay, John, for one second, as I was reading that lead and I was reflecting on your life here, and we have watched you go from WWE to this rocket ship that's taken you into movies and books and all kinds of things. Do you, when you sit and sort of reflect back and go, I remember back then, what is it, what's that ride been like? Well, thank you for the kind words, but yeah. actually Today Show is not, you're not just a spectator, you're an integral part in, in all of this. I mean, I, uh, 
transforming from live performance to yeah. film takes a lot of nuance, and I learned a lot of it here on the Today Show with you guys. So remember you co-hosted with me? I remember, Do you remember? all the time. We yeah. did a wedding. I officiated <laughs> yes, somehow. Yes, you yeah. did. You did Squatted it all. Squatted Al Roker. <laughs> we just saw that. Yeah, it's been a crazy ride, but what? you guys have been an instrumental part oh. of that, so well, it's always great to be back. A Fast 10 is something special, obviously. The last time you were on Fast and Furious, you were the newbie. You were joining this cast that had been in place for a long, long time, and you were a bad guy. Yes. So now, in Fast 10, you are no longer the bad guy, which I always thought you were miscast in any way. So Thank you. tell me about your new role in uh, this one. So I get to be a cool uncle. Uh, the family is in trouble with a bad guy who has no intentions of turning good, and this time in Fast 10 with Jason Momoa. Mm -hmm. He steals the show in his role, and I get to be the cool uncle to take uh, Lil B, uh, little <laughs> Brian Toretto, on a road trip to try to get him to safety. And action and adventure ensues. The weather's warming up, and it's gonna—it's great weather for a summer box office. And Fast Ten is exactly that. It's okay. a blockbuster. Okay. So wait, what about stunts and all that driving? What were you doing? Were you doing all of it or some of so it? So the car is actually practical. They built like five cannon cars, and it can actually fire. It doesn't like fire uh, cannon rounds. Yeah. But it was all practical. And there's there's some physical stuff in there. And there. I was I was very proud to be able to know that I still got it. So I was able to do you some some of my own still stuff. Still got it. You yeah. got it. After the break, we're switching gears to television. We'll be right back. Welcome back. From the big screen to the small, there was no shortage of great TV shows this year. So let's talk about a couple shows that some ran to the couch to watch each week and that many of us just binged all at once. First up, Queen Charlotte, a Bridgerton story. It's a prequel to the Netflix series Bridgerton, and it had an explosive first season. Fans just couldn't get enough of the chemistry between the young Queen Charlotte and King George, played by India Armatifio and Corey Milcrease. The duo stopped by with some of the cast to dish on the series. If you're a Bridgerton fan, you got reason to celebrate the prequel, Queen Charlotte, a Bridgerton story, hits Netflix tomorrow. Okay, it centers on the young queen's rise to power and her marriage to King George. It's quite spicy. Take a look. Mm. Hello, my lady. Are you in need of assistance of some kind? If you must know, I'm trying to climb over the garden wall. Whatever for? You refuse to help a lady in distress. I refuse when she's trying to go over a wall so that she does not have to marry me. Hello, Charlotte. Your Majesty. To you, I am George. Ooh. Ooh. We already know it's going to be good. Nice. We already know. All right, nice. with us now, Corey Milchrist is here. India Armatifio is here, and Arsima Thomas. Hi, y'all. Hey. You are shooting out of the cannon hard. This is big. Okay, wait, Corey and India. We have to talk about the chemistry. Yes. What? Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> the chemistry between y'all. It really yeah, yeah, yeah. jumps right out at you. I mean, it it does? Yeah. we saw that with just the one, one hand second. held. Sometimes it's something subtle that makes for chemistry. Would you all agree? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, um, it's the things unsaid with us. Uh, yeah, I, d I don't know. I think um, I, we were talking last night, actually. I, I yeah. don't know if we understand the science behind it ourselves. It really? just happens. Uh, yeah. 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 Did you know it from the beginning when you guys met each other? Or? Yeah, I think so. I, I had done a chemistry read with someone else prior. Mm. Um, and, um, <laughs> yeah. And, um, I, I, yeah, I, you know, I, I could do the scene with them, and it was great. But then I, I kind of stepped into the room with Corey, and it was almost kind of instantaneous. Just oh, amazing, she says. It's, it was just amazing. <laughs> <laughs> that's, no, that's, those are the words that you yeah. Is this the first time you guys have worked together? Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, of course. Yeah. It's like first proper job as well, really. Yeah, yeah. So Your first, yeah. Proper first proper job. job? I've done like one day on something else, but yeah. Wow, yeah, yeah, yeah. that must be kind of a crazy first breakthrough. So, so normal for me. <laughs> no, yeah, I'm, it's very surreal and I'm very, very grateful. Uh, yeah, it's been it's been a, a wild and amazing how ride. Did, how was it when you found out you got the role? Uh, I, yeah, it was, it was like midnight because it it was, an, it was made on LA time, yeah. and it was it was it was London. I was in shock, and I ended up going to a snooker bar. I don't know if you guys have snooker. What is a snooker like bar? A, like a pool bar, oh, it's like, which is the most yours. random thank place. Thank you for translating. Yeah, <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Arsima, um, we've got to talk to Arsima, you. Arsima, your career trajectory is crazy. No, you have yeah. the craziest trajectory. Run through a yes. few of the beats. Just tell us what you've done so far. Oh gosh. Uh, I, Born, um, <laughs> and nice. uh, but I so I did my undergrad uh, in biological sciences and physics uh, yeah. um, at uh, Carnegie Mellon, and then I did my masters in health policy um, and management uh, at Yale. Uh, heard and of then, it? What we've heard of it. Her, oh, sister, yeah. her yeah. sister went to. Oh, nice. Yeah. Okay. We should connect. Um, uh, and then I kind of uh, realized that I really had always loved acting, but was just too scared to just do it. Mm -hmm. It's kind of that thing that, like, what do you do when something doesn't love you back? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And so I realized that the risk was just it had to be taken. How so. does one cool. tell one's parents that one has decided <laughs> to go into acting after all that education? You know, uh, uh, luckily, because of this, hindsight has become very clear. <laughs> but um, my mother was not thrilled, yeah. but she definitely believed in me. She kind of could tell that there was a reason that I kept, you know, sneaking out of my master's program to New York to like audition for whatever I could find. Oh my really? God. Yeah. And so she's like, okay, you, you have the master's degree. If worst case scenario, you can just do a PhD. So yeah, she kind of, you can always, yeah, you have something yeah. to fall back on. Exactly. Okay. We yeah. talked about the chemistry between y'all. Is it true that you both, and this is spicy. Yes. Uh -uh. This show is spicy. You watched it with your mothers. India. We did. Yeah. We had a great time. Yeah. I right. mean, it was not, the four of us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it was separate. It was separate, separate but yeah. still, yeah. Uh, what kind of, were they, yeah, India, what did you do? What did your mom say, India? I mean, I think we wanted to bridge the gap and kind of unite with one another in, in a unique bonding experience. So I thought it would be a good idea to kind of just get it out of the, out of the way. This is what I have been doing for the last six months. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't awkward because I think actually she a was able to look at it from like a artistic point of view, um, if you wow. can do. Okay. Um, How about that. your mum? I my mum stayed completely silent, and then the next night we watched *Lethal Weapon*, <laughs> where Mel Gibson's uh, bum was out, and, uh, yeah, so and uh, I remember. Awesome. And then she, so the only thing that she said was, "You got a nicer bum than Mel." <laughs> Just, and that was the only thing. She stayed silent the night before when we watched it, and then I was like, right, okay, that's the weirdest thing I've ever heard. Wow. I'm going to, oh yeah, I'm going to go tonight. Right. Yeah. You guys, well, guys this is you. going to be huge. You know this. Well, you yeah. promise you'll come back when you guys. I yeah, because it'll be different after tomorrow for you guys. Yeah. But today. Don't forget about us. Tomorrow. Yes. Please okay. don't forget. Yeah, I know. This year, we saw Ted Lasso come to an end after three amazing seasons. Since its start, the show has swept at award shows, a testament to its great writing and great acting. Stars Jason Sudeikis, Hannah Waddingham, and Brendan Hunt sat down with Hoda and Savannah back in March to talk about the show's success. You know what the happiest animal on earth is? It's a goldfish. You know why? No. Got a 10 second memory. Be a goldfish, Sam. 
He's just, just running the whole thing. Wait, Richmond! 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 Let's go! Get ready to believe all over again. Everyone's favorite football turned soccer coach is back. Ted Lasso! Come on, we've been waiting. The Emmy winning comedy series is a global phenomenon. I'm going to say it again a global phenomenon. And today it's returning for season three. Jason Sudeikis stars as the incredibly optimistic coach Lasso. <laughs> Team owner Rebecca Welt Welton of the lovely Hannah Waddingham. And Ted's right hand man, Coach Beard, played by Brendan Hunt. <laughs> Guys, good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning, good morning. Yeah. Or good evening, depending yeah. on. Yeah, I was going to say, are you a morning person? I, I don't no, think you are. Not at all. None of us are. Yeah. So good luck. We're with theater this folk. <laughs> you know, but yeah, so we're out of practice from, you know, shooting early in the morning. So yeah, but, this is. Yeah. We're when so you guys pumped. go to bed at we, night? I go to bed at 8.30. Yeah, yeah. like what 8. What is that? What is that? We go, we like keep toddler hours. We have yeah, yeah, to. Yeah. 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 By the way, they came outside with signs in the cold for you guys. Yeah. There are Aww. very few shows anymore on television that attract an audience like this show has. Um, it's like us in true crime docs. <laughs> A Dateline. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. exactly yeah. I mean, does it? I mean, what does it feel like at season, as we approach season three to realize it's it's got all this a massive out. pressure? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean the expectations like a little bit lottie dog because. It is what it is, and we're doing what we what we were hoping to do, and we just hope people dig it. But we were surprised people That's dug so it. That's so Ted Lasso with you. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I I'm not I'm not that good of an actor uh, <laughs> <laughs> to be that different. But like, yeah, I, I I mean, it's it's we were overwhelmed by the response. I mean, and continuously, and and the way people were just so excited for it to come out. We we're we tried to say the lines as quick as we could to get through it, and, like, <laughs> and then you know here we are. Yeah, it's hard to believe. You got to get it right, man. Yeah, yeah, you do, <laughs> Brendan. I, you were giving me the the look when we were starting yeah. the story because we used. That's just. His face. I yeah. know. Oh. <laughs> Yeah. So again, I'm not that great an actor. Really. <laughs> I thought it was the stink guy because we showed an old clip. I just wanted yeah. you to know that we have a season three clip. We do. Well, so prove we, it. Yeah, so oh, we all see what we, we have to do. It. This guy, segment roll producer the Brendan roll the Hunt. Time. <laughs> well, hey, how about this one? Regarding my panic attacks, I've had more psychotic episodes than Twin Peaks. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm so crazy. How oh, crazy are you? There we go. <laughs> Oh. Oh. Guys, actually, good. You know, we what? are so mad at him. I'm so mad. Oh. Have you considered killing off Nate? I'm really yeah. mad. No. I'm so Why angry. No. Spoilers. Upset. Yikes. No, I'm mad. We just had a baby. It's his, yeah. Everything yeah. Well, his, was. His in wife real did. life? In real yeah. life. In real life. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Spoilers. Spoilers. <laughs> well, Nate has a baby. Say, yeah, I was no, just yeah, talking yeah. about yeah. the show. No, yeah. no, no. Yes. Nick, I mean, that's like. I, I, I mean, for my money, like the work that Nick does on the show as Nate, the work that Phil has done as Jamie Tart, and the work that Tony Head does as Rupert, to be like our three, like you know, turds, if yeah. you will. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. Turds is a good. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> um, that like, yeah, that's just a credit to that, how strong an actor. So like, as much as as Nick has been hated since the end of season two, really, I, I would. That's just. That's just. You know, big ups to him for doing yeah. for having to deal with that because he's those they're all three sweetie pies. <laughs> yeah. Real silly boys. Yeah, yeah. that's so too. brilliant. Yeah. In job. Ken, is there any chance for redemption? Yes. Mm. Who knows? I don't. I'm not good at answering things when people haven't seen anything yet. <laughs> Talk to someone so else. Are you pleading so <laughs> the fifth? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Are you all done? So season, season three is is done. There's Is editing. The We're still editing. You're a editing, couple, so you know everything things. that happens. So is this going to be the end of all of Don't this? Don't look. Stop looking at me. I can't help it. Eyeball them. No, I no. Think you we might think spill. you're the weakest. Yeah. 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 I am. <laughs> yeah, they know. They know. <laughs> they do. Yeah. They're the righty people. They've the read. They've read the scouting them. report. <laughs> go, after, go after Waddingham. So Hannah, where is your uh, your Emmy? Where do you keep that? Yeah. I did keep it in my little girl's room, but you know the wings are too pointy, and I didn't want her you know to have an eye out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So now I don't. I literally. You know how people are like, oh, they casually have it in their bathroom or whatever. If anyone goes, oh, look, there it is, I'm like, yeah, yeah, don't touch it! <laughs> really? She is my beautiful golden baby. I have to and say, my daughter's quite nice, too. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to let you guys slip out so quickly, yeah. um, Jason yeah. and Brendan, uh -huh. executive producers of the hit show Ted Lasso. Sure. Could there be a season yeah. four? Please. I mean, I don't know. Oh, gosh, we haven't thought about this at all. That's <laughs> you haven't been asked. Huh, I was wondering if this was ever going to come up. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I guess we... 
Oh gosh, but Wait. we did the thing. Oh, I don't know. We I should, don't know, man. We got to come up with a clever answer for this. <laughs> All those deaths. How are we going to come back? Yeah, from exactly. That? Well, you know, that's the thing. You know. Well, who? Uh, how about this? Who in the show is yes, most good. likely to have a spinoff? Oh, character? there you go. There you go. There you go. And don't say Nate because I'm. Oh, we're mad. We're mad at yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, I still think um, uh, Roy's niece Phoebe. Uh, <laughs> and it's a, and May and, and May and yep. together they fight oh, crime yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> in Cornwall, <laughs> swearing all over the place. Yeah. What a great show! Now it was a great year for movies and TV overall. Despite everything, I'm so glad we got to dig into a few of them. That rounds out our Pop Star Plus 2023 Rewind. It has been a blast catching up with all of you.